The story of Anubarak starts off with the War of the Spider. Anubarak was the king of the Nerubians in Northrend, a race of insectoid monsters created by the Old Gods. When the Lich King Nerzul set up shop in Northrend, he went about conquering all living things there and turning them into his army. But when he ran into the Nerubians, they were much harder to subjugate than everything else he came across. And much to his chagrin, he found out that the Nerubians were immune to his plague of undeath. So in order to raise the Nerubians into his army, he had to basically do it manually the old-fashioned way, which started a multi-years-long war of attrition because they couldn't actually beat the Nerubians in open combat, as the Nerubians were experts of guerrilla warfare. So the Lich King's idea of beating the Nerubians was just to slowly whittle down their numbers and raise their fallen allies as undead. And then eventually, he was able to kill Anubarak and raise him as his best servant. Then, with how hard it was to take down Anubarak and raise the Nerubians, Lich King thought to himself that he really liked his new puppet of Anubarak. He was a very powerful undead monster he had under his control, who was able to lead his army of Nerubians for him on his own. So he decided he wanted more strong minds working under him just like Anubarak. And that's when he sent out his psychic signal to around the world looking for allies, which attracted Kel'Thuzad. When Kel'Thuzad made his way to Northrend, Anubarak was the person who greeted him. Anubarak then went around the necropolis, showing Kel'Thuzad all that he was to know about the Lich King, his plague of undeath, and what they were all about. And Kel'Thuzad was so impressed by Anubarak, as he was this giant insectoid monster that was completely subservient to the Lich King, while he was only able to raise rats back home, and not even very well. Kel'Thuzad, in awe of Anubarak, said that in exchange for immortality, Anubarak had chosen to serve the Lich King, which was remarkable. To which Anubarak replied, Agreed implies choice. Basically telling Kel'Thuzad that he did not choose to serve the Lich King of his own free will. Then Kel'Thuzad goes off and does his own thing, which is covered in another Villain's Corner video. But then Anubarak's story doesn't pick up again until Arthas is trying to return to Northrend. With the Lich King weakening, Arthas was also pretty weak as well as he was almost just killed by Sylvanas. So he really needed to get back to the Frozen Throne and fuse with the Lich King in order to fix his power crisis. But Illidan with his forces of Naga and Blood Elves were in Northrend as well, and some of the Blood Elves found Arthas and attacked him, to which Anubarak had to come in and save him. Since Illidan's forces were everywhere, they couldn't just go straight to the Frozen Throne, and instead devised a plan to get there without having to fight through Illidan's army. So in order to establish an army of their own, they went and formulated a plan to kill the blue dragon Saffron, so they could raise him as a powerful ally and steal his treasures to bolster their forces. After succeeding in killing the blue dragon, Anubarak told Arthas that he could take him through the underground ruins of Azrul Nerub to reach Ice Crown. And while navigating the underground labyrinth city, most of the inhabitants kept saying, Traitor King, to which Arthas remarked, I didn't know they knew who I was. And Anubarak replied with a, I believe they're referring to me. Because you see, not all the Nerubians died during the War of the Spider, but the Lich King did send Anubarak in there to kill them from time to time, so the remaining Nerubians thought of Anubarak as the traitor king for serving the Lich King. Anyways, as they fought their way through the underground city, they ran into some dwarves, and the dwarves were also pissed at Arthas because they thought he'd killed Mirrodin, and they were trying to block off some hidden old god thing. So Arthas and Anubarak killed the dwarves and went into the room, and then killed the old god thing that tried attacking them. Now I should mention here, the reason this old god thing attacked the Nerubians, even though the Nerubians are old god minions, is because all the Nerubians involved in this are undead, and the old gods hate the undead. I only mention this here because this little scene is brought up sometimes when people like to talk about Warcraft plot holes. Anyways, after escaping the underground city, Arthas ran into Illidan and had to fight him while Anubarak protected him from everyone else, basically allowing Arthas and Illidan to have a one-on-one. -on -one. After Arthas beat Illidan, Anubarak helped him activate the four crystals or whatever, and Arthas climbed the frozen throne and fused with Ner'zhul and became the Lich King. Now, Blizzard said they had a lot of plans for Anubarak for Wrath of the Lich King, but then they ended up scrapping the gigantic zone of Azul Nerub, and I assume with this, they also scrapped whatever story they had planned for Anubarak. Because Anubarak in Wrath of the Lich King was basically just a boss in a dungeon that you had to kill. And then he was a raid boss for Trial of the Crusader, 
who he had to kill after the Lich King broke the ground from underneath the stadium. And after killing Nubarak, he does thank you for finally freeing him from his service from the Lich King. Because the Nubarak never liked serving him, and Arthas was constantly afraid he might break free and attack him during their journeys together to the Frozen Throne. In this episode of the Villain's Corner, we will be going over the Void Lords, definitely the most powerful villains in Warcraft lore. The Void Lords themselves are heavily inspired by HP Lovecraftian horror, and I think explaining what this is will give you a better idea about the Void Lords as we continue on in this video. In regular horror, there's a bad guy that can be defeated, as vampires are vulnerable to the sunlight, werewolves can be stopped with silver bullets, etc, etc. What sets Lovecraftian horror in its own genre is that the bad guys cannot possibly be defeated, because they're so ridiculously overpowered. The outer gods in the Cthulhu mythos exist outside their universe, and when people accidentally catch a glimpse of the outer gods' true forms, they just straight up go insane. Lovecraftian horror isn't about defeating a villain, it's about hoping the villain pretends you don't exist, and leaves you alone, because there's nothing you can do about it if they decide to destroy your planet. Thankfully, the Void Lords in World of Warcraft are not that powerful, but they're pretty close. Warcraft Void Lords are more like pure forces of corruption, and not really individual beings who exist outside the universe. It's just a void energy that has a hard time taking shape in the universe, and does so in the form of old gods and minor void entities. The Void Lords themselves are aware that the Titans are the strongest beings in the universe, and attempted at one point to try to corrupt fully aware Titans, and failed miserably. And since they completely gave up on trying to corrupt adult Titans, they thought they could try their hand at trying to find a sleeping Titan inside of a random planet. So, they sent small fragments of themselves to countless random planets all throughout the universe in an attempt to corrupt them, and hopefully by chance find a sleeping Titan planet, all with the ultimate goal of corrupting a Titan and turning them into a Void Titan, which would easily make it the strongest thing in the universe. And one day, while a Titan named Sargeras was fighting some demons, he discovered that some of them were using Void powers. So he decided to investigate the source of this power and discovered the Void Lord's existence, and also discovered that they were intelligent beings who were far more powerful than any demon. He really didn't know much more about them though, as he didn't really have a way to get any more information about them, so he just kind of ignored them for the time being and went to continue fighting demons in the universe, which were a much more pressing issue as they caused random destruction everywhere they went. Eventually in his travels, Sargeras discovered a world with a sleeping titan inside of it that was completely controlled by a couple of old gods, and also discovered that some dreadlords were on the planet and working for those old gods. So, being very familiar with all of the types of demons, he decided to capture these dreadlords and question them, asking them why they were working for the old gods. And these dreadlords eventually gave Sargeras all the information he needed to know about the void lords, basically who they are and what their ultimate goal was i.e. take control of a titan to create a void power titan who would be the strongest thing in the universe and consume all the matter and energy in the universe to eventually bring everything under the void lord's control. And with what Sargeras saw on this planet, combined with what the dreadlords had told him, was enough to make Sargeras afraid for the first time in his life. Afraid of what the void lords were capable of. So Sargeras cut the planet in half with his sword, and destroyed the sleeping titan along with all of the old gods on the planet, and then went back to his titan pantheon to tell them what happened. Sargeras had come up with an ingenious plan to counter this new void lord threat he just discovered, and his plan was to destroy all life on every single planet in order to allow the universe to start over, as there was no way to tell how many planets had already been corrupted. Ideally, all under the watchful eye of the titans, of course, so that there would be no void or corruption at all and Sargeras was very saddened to hear that his fellow Pantheon members were being very unreasonable about his proposed strategy, so he left the meeting in a huff in order to put his plan into work anyway, if the other Titans were going to be so irrational about his plan. So he went off to create the Burning Legion. And Sargeras was kind of right in a way, as a few of the Void Lord's tiny little minions crashed into a planet that would eventually be known as Azeroth, and they were very happy to find that there was a Titan soul inside this planet, and not only was there a titan soul, but was one strong enough to rival Sargeras. So they hit the jackpot. So they went to corrupting the world, but had to deal with the elementals who ruled the planet's surface first. 
and pretty easily defeated the four elemental lords and turned them into their minions. Eventually, the Titans found this planet, saw that its surface was corrupted by the old gods, which they were able to recognize from Sargeras' story, and wanted to see if they could help as kind of a see, we can uncorrupt Titan souls type thing. So they created some Titan Watchers to go down to the planet in order to defeat the old gods. And then eventually, after a long battle, one of the Titans just decided to rip one of the old gods out of the planet, but then found out the old gods already infused themselves with the planet itself. So killing the old gods would probably destroy the planet. So they changed their strategy to just imprison them instead, and then left the Titan Watchers there to watch over those prisons. Then the Titans left the planet on its own, as it was no longer in danger of being turned into a Void Titan. And then they had another meeting with Sargeras, presumably many years later, there's no real time frame on this, where Sargeras eventually killed all the other Titans and stored their souls in Argus, because Sargeras thought eventually they would probably come to see reason, you know? And then through a series of events that I cover in a lot more detail in the yogg saron and Cthulhu Villains Corner videos, the old gods were able to weaken their prisons in order to attempt an escape, but then they got pushed back down anyway, with the most recent attempt to be an escape being done by Nazoth. Now, the Void Lords were able to create a creature in the physical universe called Dementius the All-Devouring. This Void creature has unknown origins and eventually started attacking the Ethereal's homeworld planet of Karesh. Zalatath, the Shadow Priest artifact weapon, talks about Dementius, and describes his creation as a manifestation of fragments, shadows, the faintest of echoes of the Void Lords. And since the homeworld of the Ethereals did not have a Titan inside of it, Dementius took great efforts to keep his form in the physical world and had to constantly devour matter and energy in order to grow in strength. And it actually took him many years to devour the entire home planet. And it's because the Ethereals fought back that something happened during the battle which destroyed their physical bodies, and is the reason they look the way they do, as beings of pure energy surrounded in wrappings. And it's also the reason a lot of ethereals are tied directly to the void, because a lot of them got corrupted in the process of this whole world devouring thing. And eventually Dementias went to a second planet, and it was in its attempts of devouring this other planet that he was eventually destroyed by a Naru named Turi, who destroyed itself in the process and the fragments of its body were eventually used to create the Holy Priest artifact weapon from Legion. Considering Dementius was only the faintest of Echoes version of a Void Lord, and he was able to destroy a planet, that should give you an indication of how powerful the Void Lords could be, if they actually gained control of a Titan host. Now, since Void Lords rule over Void Energies, it's speculated there could be things known as Light Lords, who rule over Light Energy and that possibly Naru are just the agents of the Light Lords, as they've been shown to corrupt people as well, as seen with the Maghar Orc Allied Race scenario, or during the rejection of the Gift Cinematic with Illidan. It's also theorized that Elune could be one of these Light Lords, as Velen theorized that Elune could have just been a Naru, as its energies were very similar to one. But this pissed off the Night Elf, so he never brought it up again. But Elune has been shown to have more power than the average Naru, especially since it does everything without having to come down to Azeroth or be physically present. Khadgar even theorizes that it was Elune who created the prime Naru, Zera, when he was thinking of ways to use the Tears of Elune in order to unlock the information stored within Zera's core. Of course, all of this Light Lord stuff is pure speculation, so I think I'll just end it there. So, as far as we know, that's everything we know about the Void Lords so far, as kind of the whole point of them is to not know much about them, similar to Lovecraftian horror. The story with Arthas starts after the Second War. Arthas was just a kid after the Second War ended, and he wanted to be a hero like all of the people who fought in the war, and started getting special training by Mirrodin in order to learn how to fight. Some years later, Jaina paid a visit to Lordaeron, and Arthas offered to help escort her to Dalaran. And during the trip, they took a stop at an orc internment camp. Arthas remarked that he saw nothing but monsters and murderers as he looked at the orcs. And Jaina remarked that she felt bad for them, and they looked kind of sad. Despite their little difference in this one regard, Jaina and Arthas grew very close and became great friends. Arthas then starts his training to become a paladin, and eventually goes to Dalaran in order to, quote, study there, but was actually there just to flirt with Jaina. Eventually, the two start dating, but do so in secret. One day, Jaina drops a book, and then sneaks into a corner to kiss Arthas, 
when Kelthos catches them in the act when he was trying to return the drop book. Kelthos was also interested in Jaina at this time, and called Arthas out on this, saying if he was going to date Jaina, he should do it openly and not in secret. Arthas remarked that they were both in important positions and didn't want people gossiping, and Kelthos scolded Arthas for being afraid of gossip as a reason for hiding their relationship, and then walked off. Arthas couldn't really disagree with this, so it did bother him a little bit. Only a little bit though, him and Jaina kept dating for a few years and grew very close after this. Then one day, during a casual date, Jaina remarks that their future children would have blonde hair, which completely freaks Arthas out, as he's not sure about the future, and then broke up with Jaina over this, mainly because he thought he would make a bad husband and father or something, and broke things off because of his own insecurities. They both went their own ways and became important people. And then the plague started popping up. There was an epidemic of the plague that was killing people of the kingdom, and Arthas sent out to look for a cause. During his search, he ran into Jaina again, and found that the plague was being spread by the grain. They also found out that it was Kel'Thuzad who was the one spreading it, so they chased after Kel'Thuzad and killed him. But before Kel'Thuzad died, he told him that it was already too late to stop the plague. And Arthas at this point was very obsessed with trying to stop the plague, to the point where he was getting increasingly more and more hostile towards his allies as they tried to calm him down. But since they knew Arthas was only getting angry because he was worried about his people, they just kind of put up with it and helped him out anyway. Until they got to Stratholm. When Arthas arrived to Stratholm, he discovered the entire city had already been infected by the poison grain, and that there was nothing they could do to stop it, and it was only a matter of time before the entire population turned into undead. So Arthas came to the conclusion that he should kill all the citizens in the city before they turned into the undead, became violent, and an actual threat to everything else nearby. But when Arthas proposed his perfectly reasonable plan to his men, half of them were definitely not on board with this. Uther and Jaina were there as well. Uther was one of the very first paladins, and Arthas' teacher. And Uther basically told Arthas that he was not going to go kill civilians. So Arthas told Uther to get out of his sight. Jaina, upon seeing this, also left and didn't help him with Stratholm. So with all of the people who actually stayed behind, Arthas took them into the city and killed as many people as he could. Eventually, the population turned into undead halfway through, and he went on an undead killing spree. During this incident, though, Arthas lost the ability to use the light, so he could no longer be considered a paladin. And in Stratholm, he ran into a dreadlord named Malganus, who taunted him and told him he was the one responsible, and that he'd be waiting in Northrend if Arthas was brave enough to go find him. So Arthas went to Northrend to hunt down Malganus, and at this point was absolutely obsessed with hunting him down. Turns out, killing a whole city of civilians didn't exactly leave Arthas in the best state of mind. While in Northrend looking for Malganus, Arthas runs into Mirrodin, the dwarf who trained him how to fight after the Second War. It's from Mirrodin that Arthas learns about Frostmourne, a cursed rune blade told to have magical powers. So Arthas offers to help Mirrodin look for it, because without his light powers, he's nowhere near as strong as he used to be as a paladin, and he'd need some kind of new source of power to help him stop Malganus. But during his Northrend campaign, other men from Arthas' home city of Lordaeron came to Northrend to tell Arthas that he'd been ordered to return home immediately. And they also tell Arthas' men that they've all been recalled as well. So all of Arthas' men started heading back to shore in order to take their boats home. So Arthas decides to not only ignore the order to return home, but to also destroy the ships before his men could make it to the shore so they couldn't return either and be forced to stay and help. So he hires a couple of mercenaries and races to the shore and burn down all of their ships. And then when his men finally do make it to shore, Arthas blames the mercenaries and orders his men to kill them. Mirrodin was with Arthas this entire time and was increasingly not okay with what Arthas was doing. And Arthas killing the mercenaries was kind of the last straw for him. But at this point, Malganus shows up and starts sending his army after Arthas. Arthas knows he doesn't stand a chance against Malganus and his army, so he figures his best way to survive is to look for Frostmourne. Mirrodin reluctantly agrees to this and they go out and look for it as quickly as possible. When Arthas and Mirrodin finally find Frostmourne, they find out the blade is cursed, which was Mirrodin's worst fear when he first heard about the sword. This was not going to deter Arthas at this point though, so he grabbed the blade, which caused some kind of magical explosion, which knocked out Mirrodin. Arthas assumed this explosion had killed Mirrodin, so he just left him to his fate, and with Frostmourne in hand, he came under the Lich King's control. Malganus then shows up and asks what the Lich King is telling him to do, since the Lich King and Malganus are on the same side. Arthas then kills Malganus, much to Malganus' surprise, because it turns out the Lich King isn't really the greatest friends with the Dreadlords. 
Arthas then finally returns home, only to kill his father and sack his own kingdom, turning them into his own personal undead army. Then Arthas goes out and raises his horse Invincible, and decides to resurrect Kelthazad, as he was one of the Lich King's most trusted servants. So in order to do this, Arthas decides to go out and get his father's urn in order to carry Kelthazad's body, only to discover the urn is being guarded by Uther. Arthas then attacks Uther in order to grab the urn, and kills him, but nearly loses the fight in the process. Turns out Uther was really powerful. After obtaining the urn, Arthas heads to Silvermoon in order to try to use the Sun Well to resurrect Kel'Thuzad, as Arthas needed a great source of power in order to bring Kel'Thuzad back as a lich. So, with his massive army of undead, Arthas goes to Silvermoon and attempts to invade it. But, Silvermoon has a very powerful magical protection, so attacking the city is not going well for Arthas. Luckily for him, one of the elves betrays Silvermoon and shows Arthas how to get past the magical defenses. With this, he easily gets past them, kills the ranger who was giving him the most problems, Sylvanas, and raises her as a banshee to be one of his personal guards. He then goes into the city, kills about 90% of the elves, including their king, and then uses the sun well in order to bring Kel'Thuzad back to life as a lich. With Kel'Thuzad in the picture now, he tells them he now needs to go to Dalaran in order to steal the Book of Medivh, which was needed in order to bring the Burning Legion into the world. So Arthas kind of strolls into Dalaran, because he did just take out one of the hardest to sack cities on the planet. Going into Dalaran was only a slightly less difficult task. So Arthas goes into Dalaran, kills Antonidas, the leader of Dalaran, and gets the book. Kel'Thuzad then summons Archimon into the world, who then immediately transfers control of the undead to the Dreadlords, destroys Dalaran, and then goes about trying to conquer the world. It's at this point that Kel'Thuzad tells Arthas about the secret plan of the Lich King. The Lich King wanted the Burning Legion to enter the world, so they wouldn't pay attention to him. And now the Legion was busy invading the planet, he could finally break free of their control. But if the Legion did succeed in taking control of the planet, they would just take him back. So he needed Arthas to go out and help Azeroth win the war against the Burning Legion. And part of his master plan was to give Illidan the Skull of Gul'dan. Illidan, with the Skull of Gul'dan, used it to kill the final Dreadlord that was keeping the Lich King in check. Eventually, the citizens of Azeroth won the war against the Legion, and Arthas went back to Lordaeron to meet up with Kel'Thuzad. In Lordaeron, Arthas and Kel'Thuzad chased off the remaining Dreadlords and went to rebuilding their Scourge army. But then, Arthas started weakening, and the Lich King told him he needed to return to the Frozen Throne to recharge his powers. And it was at this moment that the Dreadlords attacked the city, and cut off Arthas from Kel'Thuzad. Arthas went into the forest to meet up with Kel'Thuzad again, and was ambushed by Sylvanas. Kel'Thuzad was able to come in and save Arthas at the last second, thanks to the fact that Sylvanas wanted to kill Arthas slowly, and only poisoned him first instead of killing him outright. So, Kel'Thuzad chased off Sylvanas and her banshees, and went to send Arthas off to Northrin. And it was at this point that Arthas told Kel'Thuzad that he was his only true friend, which was amazing for the Death Knight version of Arthas, who was pretty ruthless and killed everyone. This was the only time the Lich King version of Arthas called anyone a friend, or something close to an equal. When Arthas eventually made it to Northren, he found that Illidan and his forces were there looking for him. Turns out Illidan was working for Kil'jaeden, and Kil'jaeden was mad that the Lich King had broken free of his control, and had told Illidan to go kill him. So a weakened Arthas, arriving to Northren, was met by a Blood Elf hunting party, and they were still pretty mad about what he'd done to Silvermoon. Luckily, Anubarak showed up to save his hide. The new Lich King knew Arthas was weakened, and sent Anubarak there to escort him to the Frozen Throne. Anubarak told Arthas that Illidan's forces were everywhere, and they were on the lookout for him. So the only way they could make it to the Frozen Throne was by taking a secret underground Nerubian path. And while navigating the underground city, they kept hearing whispers about a traitor king. To which Arthas remarked, I didn't know they knew who I was. To which Anubarak responded, I believe they are referring to me since the Lich King would routinely send Anubarak into Nerubian territory to kill them and raise them as part of their army, and the underground route they were taking wasn't completely under the Lich King's control. Then, after attacking some old god thing and making it out of the Nerubian cave, Arthas and Anubarak ran into Kel'thas and Illidan. At this point, Illidan was very close to the Frozen Throne, and Arthas and Anubarak were on their way to try to get to it first. But Kel'thas came in with a small blood of force to try to stop them. Kel'thas and Arthas fought one-on-one, -on -one, and Kel'thas went into melee combat with Arthas, with his blade, Fela Malorn. Arthas thought this was a terrible idea, as he knew Kel'thas was a powerful mage, and that he had destroyed this blade previously when his father used it to try to stop Frostmourne. So Arthas went in to try to cut Kel'thas in half, 
but to his surprise, the blade held up. And this is what Kel'thas was aiming for. Kel'thas was trying to buy time until Illidan could reach the Frozen Throne and kill the Lich King, which would rob Arthas of his power. And elven blades get stronger whenever they're reforged, so he knew Felimalorn would be able to stand up to at least a couple of hits from Frostmourne. So Kel'thas and Arthas had a battle, and Kel'thas was doing a great job of just buying time, even if he knew he couldn't actually kill Arthas, which really upset him, and he tried to throw Kel'thas off by taunting him and talking about Jaina. Arthas asked Kel'thas if he was still mad that he had stolen Jaina away from him, to which Kel'thas said, You probably don't know this, Arthas, but Jaina loathes you now. You sicken and disgust her, and any love she once held for you has long since turned to hatred. And after hearing this, Arthas was the one who got riled up, and started attacking Kel'thas randomly in rage. At this point, Kel'thas thought that he had bought enough time by now, and teleported away. And with Kel'thas gone, Arthas recomposed himself, and headed straight to the Frozen Throne for Illidan. And Anubarak came in and stopped anyone else who might get in his way. So with Arthas and Illidan alone, they had a one-on-one -on -one battle. Illidan, very cocky that he was definitely gonna win, since Arthas was visibly tired from his fight with Kel'thas, flew into the air and showed off his twin blades of Azanoth, telling Arthas that he obtained the blades 10,000 years ago from a demon and had mastered them, and that his little rune blade that he had just acquired recently was no match for him. After hearing this, Arthas actually became very confident that he could win, since Frostmourne was basically fused with him and was an extension of himself and there's no way Illidan's stolen blades, even with the years of experience, could come close to the mastery he had with Frostmourne. So when Illidan swooped down to go in for an attack, Arthas recklessly lunged up and struck with Frostmourne with the utmost confidence, and actually landed a blow. Then Illidan and Arthas went for another exchange, in which Arthas landed the final blow, which knocked out Illidan and left him bleeding out in the snow. And since Arthas was in a hurry, he just left Illidan there and ran to the Frozen Throne as soon as possible. Anubarak then came in and helped Arthas with like the four stones or whatever that were needed in order to access the Frozen Throne. Then Arthas finally climbed it and fused with Ner'zhul and became the true Lich King. Arthas then contemplated his life and what it would mean to be the Lich King and eventually decided he needed to make a few changes. So he cut out his heart in order to get rid of the human side of him and threw it beneath Ice Crown. Then he killed Ner'zhul's spirit inside the armor Kind of. It does sort of make a reappearance later on and well. But it doesn't affect the Lich King Arthas while he was still doing his thing. Arthas then rested up for a couple of years and then decided to come out and bring order to the world. Arthas thought that a unified world ruled by the undead could better handle outside threats, like the Legion and the Void, than the stupid people constantly fighting each other over dumb things. But more powerful people than him had tried and failed to take over the world, so he needed a different approach. First thing he did was raise Sindragosa. Then he instigated a scourge invasion in cities of the Horde and Alliance in order to rile them up and provoke them to assault Northrend. Then he headed out to crush some of the Scarlet Crusade members in order to pull off a real assault on what he thought was a real threat. He sent a group of his Death Knights to Light Hope's Chapel in order to draw out a certain person, since the place had too much holy magic for him to go near it. Then, after an altercation, Tyrion Fordring came out of hiding cleansed the corrupted Ashbringer, and was able to fight off Arthas. Arthas then retreated back to Northrend to prepare his army and wait. A faction of the Death Knights rebelled against Arthas during this assault though, mad that Arthas sent them there to die, and decided to join the Alliance in the Horde. And with a letter from Tyrion, were able to talk to the respective faction's leaders without being killed, which then finally sparked the Northrend campaign. Eventually, Arthas notices something going down in the Boren Tundra, and heads down there to find one of his old Death Knights fighting one of his San Leon. He asks the Death Knight if he was there to rejoin the Scourge, but the Death Knight replies no, not after what Arthas had done to them at Light's Hope Chapel. It is then that the San Leon interjects and says he'll kill the traitors for him and bring their heads to Arthas later. Arthas and basically said, okay, sure, whatever, and then later on had to revive that San Leon because he had ultimately failed, and he ended up being one of the bosses in his Citadel later on. Arthas then went over to Zoldrak because the trolls there were willing to join the Scourge, which would be a huge boost to the undead army. Later though, the leader of those trolls loses to an adventurer and asks the Lich King for help. Arthas comes down there and kills the troll instead, and thought it was amusing that the adventurer was able to beat his new champion. So he basically just said, you can go ahead and leave, I'm not going to do anything, 
It was pretty hilarious how you killed my guy. He probably wasn't that strong anyway to lose to you. And then the adventurer just kind of leaves as there's no way he could beat the Lich King on his own. And here's the real reason why Arthas kept letting adventurers go. His real plan was to raise powerful champions from the Alliance and Horde. That way he could send them back to their capitals and let them destroy themselves in a war of attrition. In which case Arthas could just come in later and raise everyone as his servants. Meanwhile, in Nax, with Kel'Thuzad, Arthas was talking to him about his preparations with his army, when Kel'Thuzad noticed he had some intruders. So Arthas told him to quickly get rid of them and then get back to work. And then Arthas never heard from Kel'Thuzad again. Eventually, the Horde and Alliance built a gigantic army in front of Ice Crown Citadel, at the Wrathgate, after winning many battles against the Scourge and killing Kel'Thuzad. Arthas wanted them to arrive at his gates, weary from battle, not confident and strong. So, he decided he needed to join the fight himself for a hot second to give them a much-needed loss. And with both sides basically in full attendance, Arthas came out to meet them after sending a few of his minions to test them first. Arthas immediately kills Sarfang Jr., and then Putris ambushes everyone there with plague barrels that hurt both the living and the undead. Arthas, realizing how bad the plague actually is, retreats immediately, as even he can't deal with biological warfare especially not from a plague specifically designed to kill him. Sometime later, an adventurer finds Arthas's heart that he threw below the citadel. The adventurer doesn't take the heart though, but Arthas was aware that it was found, so he sent some of his cultist followers down there to grab it. And then while the cultists were dealing with the heart, Arthas notices that some of the cultists weren't actually part of his gang. So he goes on down to check it out for himself, and finds out that some of the cultists are actually hidden Argent Crusade members, including Tyrion. Tyrion then attacks the heart with the Ashbringer and destroys it, which surprisingly weakened Arthas. Arthas then went to try to kill Tyrion, but at that point reinforcements came for him and they were able to escape before Arthas could kill them all. Then, sometime later, Arthas found out that they were holding a tournament, so he dropped in to crash the party and told everyone that the tournament was actually being held above a Nerubian stronghold and broke the floor, sending all of the champions below to fight Anubarak. Arthas then retreated to let Anub deal with them, and then never heard from Anubarak again. The Horde and Alliance forces at this point had successfully pushed into Northrend from all angles, and the only thing left was to assault the Citadel directly, which is exactly what Arthas wanted. The Argent Crusade made it to his front door and broke into the Citadel, so in order to prepare for the incoming invasion, Arthas strolled on down to the Halls of Reflection in order to grab Frostmourne, only to find Sylvanas there trying to steal it. Or Jaina, depending on which faction tells this part of the story, and ends up chasing Sylvanas out, but isn't able to kill her as reinforcements come literally at the last second to save her. So Arthas just goes back to the top of his citadel and waits, gleaming in excitement at how well his plans are going. Or one would assume if he had emotions at this point. Once the bulk of the crusade finally makes it inside, including Tyrion Forgering and the greatest champions in the world, Arthas taunts them by letting them know that Bolvar Fordragon, the Lion's leader at the Wrathgate, is actually still kind of alive and currently being torched at the top of the Citadel, giving them even more incentive to make it to the top of the tower, as if they didn't already need it. And Arthas made sure to give them a lot of tests and trials, as he wanted to make sure the champions who made it to him were as strong as humanly possible. So when they did finally make it to the top of the tower, beaten and weary from battle, Arthas immediately flash freezes Tyrion, and then decides to test the remaining champions for himself. After a long and hard fight, plaguing some of them, ripping the souls out of others, Arthas finally decides, yes, these guys are the best, and would make literally the best undead fighting force in the entire planet. So he then just instantly kills all of them, showing them that he was just playing around the entire time. Arthas had succeeded in his plan, and won the final battle. So, he then goes on to try to resurrect all the champions he just killed. When, in one of the best uses of the Deus Ex Machina tropes history, Tyrion breaks out of his block of ice and shatters the Frostmourne while he's still in the middle of raising all the dead champions nearby, causing the sword to basically implode on itself, releasing all the trapped souls inside, which start attacking Arthas. Then, one of the souls that escapes, Arthas's father, resurrects all of the dead fallen champions, who then finally finish off Arthas while he's being stunned by the spirits. Then, after Arthas is killed, Bolvar Fordragon takes up the mantle of Lich King in order to keep the undead army in check, 
who would have gone wild and destroyed the world after no longer being controlled by Arthas. And for some reason, it doesn't order all the undeads to just jump into a volcano. Update on Arthas. Ever since we released the Arthas Villains Corner video, there's actually been some more lore with him in the Shadowlands expansion, which I'll summarize as follows. Firstly, his soul was forged in the Shadowlands into a soul shard. Then, this shard was used in order to forge Kingsmort. This new blade was then used to dominate Anduin, which was then promptly destroyed in the Anduin boss fight. As Arthas' soul starts fading away, Sylvanas says, May the last whisper of your name fade and be forgotten. Arthas is now deader than dead with his soul getting destroyed in the Shadowlands, with this really being the culmination of his story and there can't be possibly anything else to be told. Malagos' story starts off with the story of Galakrond. Galakrond was a huge proto-drake who gained necrotic powers from eating so many corpses of his own kind, which caused some of them to reanimate and became some of the first undead to walk Azeroth. Malagos at this time was still a normal proto-drake, and not yet a dragon. But for a proto-drake, Malagos was very smart, and had the unique ability to breathe a frost breath. And Malagos was best buddies with this other proto-drake, who would later be known as Deathwing. So obviously, a giant cannibalistic proto-drake with an army of undead proto-drakes was a huge problem. So much of a problem that the titan keeper Tyr came by to check it out and helped a group of five exceptional proto-drakes in their fight with Galakrond. They ended up losing their first fight though, and Tyr goes missing after losing his hand in the battle. Malagos and the other four future aspects rally together and decided to try again, only with tactics this time. Malagos suggested, like, shoving a giant-ass boulder down Galakrond's fat throat, since he likes to eat everything, so that he might choke to death on it. So they then went out to try to put this plan into action, and what do you know? It went off smoothly. But Galakron doesn't die right away, and is just kind of slowly choking to death while the zombie dragons fight for him. So Malagos, like, freezes the stone in place so he can't dislodge it, and Deathwing throws one of the zombie dragons in there to push it down further, which finally kills Galakron. And with Galakron dead, the zombie dragons start fighting each other, and kind of take care of themselves. After Galakron's defeat, two other Titan Keepers showed up and told them they had found Tyr and taken him to safety. They were also super impressed that five drakes could take out a monster that even a Titan Keeper lost to, and decided to turn them into the dragon aspects. So with the help of all of the Titan Keepers, except Odin, they gave the five aspects their powers, with Loken being the one to give Malagos' power over arcane magic, and was to be its protector. They also magically altered a bunch of proto-dragon eggs into dragon eggs, and thus created the dragon flights. Some years later, Loken decides to betray the other Titan Keepers and take control, and two of his giants decide to take the Storm Pigs for themselves, and decide to use the Winter-Scorned Vicryl as their army to do so, because they were the most violent tribe. So they built giant golems and captured proto-drakes with magical restraints. Then they attacked the earthen in the region completely massacred them. But survivors managed to find the keeper Tyr and ask for help. Tyr wasn't about to defeat the Winter Scorn with just him and two other titan keepers. So Tyr asked the aspects for help. The five aspects agreed to help and just completely destroyed them. Malagos was able to magic drain the giant golems and constructs and free the captured protodrakes who were being held with enchanted snares and used as beasts of war. They then covered the Winterscorn village with mists and put them all to sleep so they wouldn't go off and just kill another village. Then the War of the Ancients happened. Malfurion called on the Aspects to help as they were losing pretty badly to the Legion. Deathwing came up with an idea for the Dragon Soul to close the portals the demons were using. So Malagos went to the other aspects and convinced them to lend Deathwing their power to create the artifact. Then, after making the Dragon Soul, Deathwing used it to lash out at both the aspects and the demons, demanding that they bow before and serve him. So Malagos and his blue dragon flight surrounded Deathwing in an attempt to take the Dragon Soul with pure numbers, only to be completely wiped out. Sindragosa was also part of the blue dragons who surrounded Deathwing, and got hit so hard by the dragon soul, her beaten body got thrown all the way to Northren, where she eventually died from her wounds, trying to get back. 
Malagos was injured both physically and mentally in the attack, but not killed. But this event did make Malagos go mad and caused him to retreat to his hideout in Northrend, since he was the one who convinced the other aspects to help make the Dragon Soul, and nearly his entire flight was dead. And while in his hideout, he liked to take the form of a half-elf, half-insect-like creature with really, really skinny legs for some reason. And there Malagos stayed for around 10,000 years or so, until one of Alexstrasza's consorts came to Malagos and asked if he would help free her. You see, Alexstrasza was being held captive by the Horde, thanks to the power of the dragon soul that Deathwing had given to them, and they were using Alexstrasza to produce children so they could use them as mounts. These mounts were super duper effective, and were used to sink Derek Proudmoore's fleet during the Second War, who of course was Jaina's oldest brother, and the Alliance would have lost completely due to the Dragon Riders alone, if it wasn't for the fact that the Wildhammer Dwarves joined the fray, and could use their Griffin Riders to kill the Dragon Riders, as once the Rider was killed, the Dragon would just fly away. In exchange for Malagos' help, Coriel Straz promised that Alex Straza could use her life powers to rebuild his dragon flight, and have a chance at getting revenge on Deathwing. With the help of Nazdormu, Ysera, Malagos, and a human mage named Ronin, they were able to free Alexstrasza, beat Deathwing and drive him into hiding, and destroy the Dragon Soul, which returned the aspects back to full power. With his power back, a regrowing dragon flight, and getting his revenge on Deathwing, Malagos grew slightly less crazy and came back to his senses somewhat. Sometime later, the blue dragon Tiragosa brought a whole bunch of nether dragons back from Outlands to the Nexus, so they might absorb the magic there and become stable. They instead thought to take the Nexus for themselves and use the power to rule the world, which was kind of noisy and woke Malagos up. Malagos then, just like, straight up absorbed them all. And something about the Nether Dragon's physical makeup mixed with Malagos's actually helped him regain a lot more of his lost sanity. So with his newfound sanity, he decided it would be a great idea to divert all of the magical energies in the world to the Nexus so that no one else could use it, as it was mortals abusing power in the first place that brought the Legion to Azeroth. The mages of Dalaran eventually started to notice the lack of arcane energy where it used to be in abundance, and they also felt that the source of the disturbance was in Northrend. So a few of them went there to check it out, only to be met by Malagos himself. Malagos then told them all exactly what he was doing, and why he was doing it, and then told them to join him to help him out. Some of the mages agreed, and were transformed into the mage hunters. Everyone else was killed. Then the war with the Lich King started in full force. After taking out Kel'Thuzad and Axaramis, they finally discovered what Malagos was up to, and Malagos was getting more aggressive with hunting down mages. Dalaran really didn't want to put their fight against the Lich King on hold, but they didn't really have a choice with Malagos draining their magic, so they teleported their city to the middle of Northrend to better launch an attack on Malagos and the Nexus. The three remaining Dragonflights also took part, and decided to help out as they too agreed Malagos' plan was crazy. Plus, Alexstrasza kind of owed Ronin a favor, since he was now the leader of Dalaran. The Kirin Tor also called upon members of the Alliance and the Horde to help him out. Neither Garrosh nor Bolvar Fordragon wanted to divert their attention from the Lich King, but they eventually agreed they really had no choice but to help as they were going to need their mages in the upcoming battle with the Lich King. So, with the combined might of three of the Dragonflights, the Mages of Dalaran, plus the combined forces of the Horde and Alliance, they assaulted Malagos in the Nexus and took him out with their overkill of an army, with Alexstrasza herself landing the finishing blow. And with Malagos dead, that's the end of his story. Nazoth first made his appearance in Cataclysm, back when we only knew the name of two of the other old gods, and he never directly showed up. We never actually got to see what Nazoth looked like until Hearthstone created a card of him, which I think was the first time we ever found out what a major lore character looked like from a Hearthstone card instead of the other way around. But according to lore, Nazoth has been around since the very beginning with all the other old gods. After the four of them crashed on Azeroth, Yasharaj, Cthun, Yaxaran, and Nazoth quickly defeated the elemental lords who controlled the planet previously, 
and then they fought each other for dominance of the land. The Asharaz was the strongest of the four old gods and controlled much of the territory. According to Zalatath, Yasharaj and Nazoth had a climactic battle at the location which would be known as the Broken Shore, where Nazoth suffered a major defeat, which ultimately might have helped him survive when the Titans came. When the Titans discovered Azeroth and the Old Gods, which had corrupted the surface, they waged war on the Old Gods and then thought to end it once things weren't going super well for their Titan Keepers, by just killing the strongest Old God Yasharaj, in which case they found out that killing the Old Gods would probably destroy the planet. So they didn't kill any more of the old gods and instead went to imprisoning them. And since Yasharaj was the biggest and strongest of all the old gods, he's the one who got killed before the titans found out about this little fact about the planet. And if Nazoth had won at the Broken Shore, he might have been the biggest and strongest one. It might have been the one that was killed by the titans instead. And so Nazoth was instead the first old god to be imprisoned, with his prison located halfway between the Well of Eternity and the site which would later become known as Oldham. Since Nazoth was the weakest of the old gods, he was pretty compact inside his prison and wasn't able to break free anywhere near as well as yogg or Cthulhu. but he was able to work with them in order to corrupt mortal beings through the ages. So when the Titan Keepers created the dragon aspects and gave five dragons some of their powers, the old gods collectively worked on corrupting Deathwing and the entire Black Dragon flight. And eventually they were successful and they put a plan into place that might, maybe, put Deathwing in a position of power to release them all from their prisons, and usher in what they would call the Hour of Twilight, which is just a fancy name for the old gods being released from their prisons. Queen Ajar had been trying to bring the Legion to Azeroth using the Well of Eternity, and the forces of Azeroth were working against her to stop this from happening. So, the old gods gave Deathwing the knowledge of how to create something known as the Dragon Soul, which he told everyone would be a super powerful artifact strong enough to close the portal in the Well of Eternity and single-handedly stop the war. And the artifact was strong enough to do exactly that, but it was also secretly designed to give Deathwing an edge over all the other dragon aspects, as it required them to give a portion of their power into the Dragon Soul for it to be created. So, after Deathwing tricked all of the aspects into giving a portion of their power to the artifact, he then immediately betrayed everyone and killed most of the Blue Dragonflight. He also killed swarms of demons and night elves. Deathwing just kind of went on a killing spree and just destroyed so many things and completely rendered the other aspects powerless as he was just able to keep them frozen in place where they couldn't move or speak. Eventually, one of the red dragons, named Coral Straws, was able to break Deathwing's concentration long enough for the other dragons to counterattack, causing Deathwing to go into retreat along with the Dragon Soul. Then, Coral Straws, Brock, Cigar, and Malfurion were able to sneak in and steal the artifact from Deathwing and bring it to the Well of Eternity in order to try and invert the demon portal to suck all of the demons out of Azeroth. And this plan did work, but it worked so well that it kind of destroyed the Well of Eternity and caused the planet to break apart in the Sundering. But before the Dragon Soul could fall into the Well of Eternity as well, the bronze dragon Nazdormu grabbed the artifact and then brought it into the future, where it then returned moments later and was seized by Malfurion who placed a spell on it along with four other aspects that made it so that Deathwing could no longer use it, and they hid it from him, where he wouldn't be able to find it for another 10,000 years. And with the world breaking apart due to the Sundering, the city of the Night Elves was slowly sinking into the ocean, and Queen Ajara tried her best to create a force field around the city to keep all the water out. But eventually, as the pressure of the ocean got too much to handle, she wasn't able to hold the force field for very much longer, and it cracked, flooding the city and would have killed everyone, if it wasn't for Nazoth's intervention. Nazoth sent a fish to Queen Ajar as a vessel to talk to her, and proposed a bargain with her that, if she would agree to work for him, he would give her enough power to save her and her people. Queen Ajar immediately rejects this offer, and then offers a counter-offer, where she'll agree to work with him, but not for him, in exchange for that exact same power. Nazoth begrudgingly agreed to these terms, surprisingly, and turned Queen Ajar and her people into the Naga, as well as giving Queen Ajar herself a lot of extra old god powers. Sometime later, when the roots of the world tree Andrasil reached Yaxaron's prison, it allowed entrance into the Emerald Dream by all of the old gods, including Nazoth, where he planted a piece of himself in there which later became known as Ilganoth. Although Nazoth wouldn't do much with the Emerald Dream until later, because after the defeat of the Lich King, Nazoth thought the world was sufficiently weak enough for him to make his move and enact the Hour of Twilight again. 
So Nizoth reached out to all of his minions and instructed them to do a coordinated attack effort, starting with Deathwing, who had gone through a lot since his time during the War of the Ancients, and the whole Dragon Soul fiasco. Nizoth instructed his minions to attach Elementium plates to Deathwing in Deepholm, and also infuse Deathwing with lots of his powers, which Deathwing wasn't really able to handle as it twisted his body into all kinds of tentacly shapes underneath. So the metal plates were basically there to hold his body together, as it was constantly breaking apart. Then, when Deathwing exploded from Deepholm, he flew around Azeroth causing all kinds of natural disasters to occur, which was a great distraction for the other three plans Nizoth had cooked up. Nizoth also called on all of the Elemental Lords to assist him, but only Alakir and Ragnaros embraced his command. The other two did not and refused to serve him. In exchange for helping Nizoth, he had promised to release Alakir and Ragnaros from their prisons in the Elemental Plains, and he also promised Deathwing control over the rest of the world and the elimination of the other dragon aspects. But he had no plans on actually giving this to Deathwing, and planned on killing him as soon as he was done with his task. Since Neptulon refused Nizoth's call, he also called upon Queen Ajara in order to capture him, because if he had control of Neptulon, he can control the world's oceans and seas, cutting off all sea travel between Azeroth's continents. So his three plans were to send the Naga to Vashir to capture Neptulon, so that they could control the world's oceans, send Ragnaros to Mount Hyjal to burn the world tree, which would cause irrecoverable damage to the planet, and his last plan was to attack the Forge of Origination in Uldum, so that he could claim the Forge of Origination for himself. Now, the Forge of Origination is an incredibly powerful Titan-created device, which was basically installed as a reset button for the planet, where it had the ability to destroy all life on Azeroth, just in case the surface got corrupted or something, which would have been a very convenient tool for Nizoth to gain control of. And Nizoth only needed one of his plans to succeed in order to usher in the Hour of Twilight, and with all of them going on simultaneously, along with Deathwing being a great distraction, there was no way he wouldn't succeed. Except for the fact that literally, every single one of his plans was stopped. And Nizoth was very surprised that all of his minions were thwarted at every turn. And in fact, Ragnaros and Alakir were even killed in the Elemental Plains, so he lost two of his strongest minions. So, Nizoth gave Deathwing the rest of his strongest remaining minions, including Yorsage and Warlord Zanas, and charged them with taking the Wormrest Temple. Unfortunately, both of his generals were killed, and the mortal races had somehow acquired the Dragon Soul, which was used by the Orc Thrall to shoot a hole through Deathwing's chest. As it turns out, they had gone back in time to that point where the Dragon Soul had disappeared for a few moments, and then brought it to the present. So, Deathwing ran to Deepholm to enact the final backup plan, which was basically to tear the planet apart. However, before he could get there, a group of adventurers had jumped on his back and tore his Elementium plates off causing his body to basically fall apart in the sky. So Nazoth had to give him extra power, which caused his body to turn into a completely tentacly monster and no longer really resembled the form of a dragon. But Thrall had chased him down and was able to use the dragon soul to finish him off. So with Deathwing and all of his best minions dead, Nazoth was kind of stuck with only two things left. His control of Ajar and the Naga, and his slight control over the Emerald Dream thanks to Ilganoth. So, when the Burning Legion launched a full-scale invasion of Azeroth again, Nazoth sent his minion Xavius to set forth the Emerald Nightmare, as it allowed them to ever so slowly loosen the prison of Nazoth while everyone was busy, until a group of adventurers was able to go into the Emerald Nightmare, free Malfurion, and kill Ilganoth and Xavius, which kind of put an end to those plans for now. After the Legion is defeated, and Sargeras stabs a sword into the planet, a Shadow Priest who was wielding the blade called Zalatath use the remaining power of the blade in order to stop the corruption from the sword of Sargeras. And then, sometime later, the soul of Zalatath made a bargain with Nazoth, to bring him Azeroth's champion in exchange for being freed from his control. So Zalatath called out to the Shadow Priest champion, and told him that the Naga were looking for three relics to perform a ritual, which would bring about a storm that would wipe out all non-believers on the planet, and that she knew exactly how to stop them. She also brings up the fact that she helped you defeat the Legion, as kind of a bargaining chip in order to trust her, which works incredibly well. So the Shadow Priest goes out and collects the three artifacts for her, and then she performs a ritual which brings Nizoth to their location. Nizoth then frees Zalatath from the blade, and then bestows a gift upon the adventurer. And then later on, a horde force goes into the Crucible of Storms and kills Unat in order to recover these three artifacts, and they find Zalatath as well 
which compels whoever picks it up to bring it to their warchief. The blade then eventually leads forces of Alliance and Horde to the city of Nashtatar, where Queen Ajara is able to trap them in her city, and then tricks a group of adventurers into using their Heart of Azeroth to open the last prison, which would allow Nazoth to finally escape. Although they do manage to kill Queen Ajara in the process, whose body is taken away by Nazoth and she is revived and placed in a prison. With Nazoth finally free, he goes about trying to reclaim the Forge of Origination so that he can use its power to kill everyone, as well as the engine of Nalikshah, located in Pandaria. Since the Forge of Origination can be used to kill all life on Azeroth, that's kind of a big deal. Since, remember, it was originally meant as a reset button to the planet. And the engine of Nalik can be used to create things, even life itself, so its power is nearly limitless in its potential uses. Rathion, one of Deathwing's sons who was not corrupted by the old gods, with the help of adventurers, the Keeper Ra, and the Titan Construct Mother, is able to stop Nazoth from taking control of these two Titan facilities. Mother is a Titan Construct who was created for the sole purpose of research in the old gods and finding a way to remove them from the planet, and is able to come up with a plan that might be able to kill Nazoth, or at the very least, severely weaken him to the point where he can be contained again. You see, Mother spent so many years researching the Old Gods that she was able to accidentally create one of her own, and is probably the premier Old God expert in the Warcraft universe, as she was like a supercomputer left behind by the Titans to focus on a single objective, and when she never heard back from the Titans, she just kept working on it to a fanatical but very accurate degree. And because of this, she was able to find a way to combine the powers of the Forge of Origination through the engine of Nalik to create a super weapon that would act like a scalpel to remove Nazoth from the planet. Something which even impressed the Titan Keeper Ra Din, who created these two devices. So a group of adventurers go into the sleeping city of Nihilatha to fight Nazoth, so they can get close enough to use the super weapon to hopefully kill him. But during their adventures, they run across Queen Ajara, who is currently being tortured in a prison next to the Blade Zalatath. Once adventurers free Ajara, she tells everyone that the Blade is the only way to contain Nazoth, and that she had been planning on stabbing it into him the entire time, but she got killed right before she was able to do it. So with Zalatath in hand, they make their way to Nazoth's core, and Rathion uses the Black Blade to cut a path open to the heart of Nazoth, where, after a lengthy battle, they manage to weaken Nazoth enough to the point where the holder of the Heart of Azeroth is able to channel the energies of the engine and forge directly into Nazoth's weakest point, killing him for the time being. And that brings us to the end of the story of Nazoth. Whether he actually dies or not is kind of up in the air, as super powerful beings don't really stay dead in Warcraft lore. But for the time being, he is defeated and probably won't show up anytime soon in the future. Hogger is a null, which is usually just a low-level quest mob in WoW. But of all the low-level quest mobs, gnolls were actually a huge threat to the humans of Stormwind at one point. You see, gnolls are stupid and very aggressive. They constantly fight each other over really dumb and petty things, like who has bigger teeth or whose shadow is larger. So an organized force of these morons was something no one thought could happen. But one day, a gnoll was able to actually rein in the other gnolls, an intelligent gnoll who actually managed to get the other dumb gnolls to pay attention and follow his orders. And with the vast amounts of them, and their naturally aggressive nature, they became a huge threat to Stormwind under this intelligent gnoll. And this gnoll was known as Packlord Garfank, not Hogger. This all happened about 80 years before Vanilla WoW's timeline. Anyways, Garfang would send out assaults on Stormwind, and while the Knights of Stormwind battled his army, he would send forces to the surrounding area and pillage and burn the farms and villages outside of Stormwind. And the forces he threw at Stormwind were so large that they couldn't afford to send out soldiers to defend the surrounding area while it all took place. This tactic of attacking Stormwind and pillaging the undefended surrounding areas worked so well that they managed to take a third of all human settlements outside the city during the Null Wars. It was so bad that the king of the city thought they were close to losing the war, so he sent out requests of help to Lordaeron and Gilneas, but they declined to help and told him to deal with it themselves. So King Barathin Rin, Varian Rin's grandfather, 
personally led a small team of his best knights to Red Ridge Mountain during one of the Knoll attacks. And luckily, they were able to find Garfang. Since the forces Garfang sent out to both attack Stormwind and pillage the surrounding areas was so large, his personal defense was small. So the king and his men fought Garfang for a whole day before King Baratheon himself dealt the killing blow to Garfang and losing half of his knights in the process. With Garfang dead, the Knolls immediately started infighting between themselves to fill the new leadership position and basically took care of themselves for the humans since they just started killing each other in mass numbers. And with the much smaller and disorganized force of Knolls, they were no longer a problem and dealt with rather easily. And that was the end of the Knoll Wars. So, how does this all relate to Hogger? Well, because of the Knoll Wars, humans take Knoll threats pretty seriously, and put a bounty on Hogger because he seemed to be a lot stronger than normal Knolls, and had already killed everyone sent after him. After players confront Hogger, they find out he's actually the leader of the Riverpaw Knolls, who come in to aid him during this fight and he is instead arrested and taken to the Stormwind Stockades to maybe put an end to Knoll aggression once and for all. But while in the Stockades, Hogger's Knolls manage to sneak in and kill all the guards and cause a riot. Then, players are sent into the Stockades to stop him and his Knolls, and the quest to kill Hogger in the Stockades is even called the Knoll King. Obviously, being a dungeon boss, he was defeated by... A band of adventurers. But with a new Null King almost in the making, Hogger could have been a real threat if he had managed to escape. But he didn't. He was killed. Now, as to why Hogger is so well known, well, it's because he was a very hard elite mob in the human starting zone. Seen as back in the day, before Blood Elves were added to the game, humans were the most popular race people picked. And after going around killing easy mobs, most people didn't think an elite mob would be that much harder. Hogger was a higher level than the zone he was in as well, which was how Blizzard balanced hard, low-level mobs and dungeon bosses back in the day. They just made them a higher level than the content they were supposed to be in. So a group of newbies working together was all but required to take him down. And because of this, a lot of new players died. And a lot of new players were human, so Hogger became a well-known mob of terror. Despite the fact that the Defias mobs in the very next human leveling zone were more dangerous number-wise. Many, many more people died to the Defias pillagers and trappers than ever did to Hogger. In fact, they come in at number 5 on Blizzard's list of the most deadly mobs in Vanilla WoW with Hogger not even making that list, despite Hogger having his own kill stat. So really, I should have made a video on the Defy's Pillagers instead. Kalthos' story starts off with Silvermoon. You see, Kalthos was the Prince of Silvermoon, and the King was very well loved by his people. Kalthos himself was also very accomplished and talented in his own right, being a member of the Council of Six in Dalaran, a very prestigious position. And Kelthos cared about his people, and they liked him in kind. So how does someone who starts off as such a nice guy end up as a villain? Well, that's what a lot of people asked too when the Burning Crusade expansion came out, which wasn't really properly explained until very recently with the Illidan novels in Chronicles 3. Now, let's talk about Jaina for a bit. Jaina was sent to Dalaran as a teenager, and put under Antoninus as his apprentice, who was the leader of Dalaran. Kalthos was totally into this teenager. Kalthos found out that her and Arthas were dating in private, and blew up on Arthas, telling him that he should at the very least be open about their relationship and not cower at the thought of rumors like they were. This, of course, upset Arthas, but he also knew Kalthos was 100% right, so he broke things off with Jaina, so they could both focus on their futures. Then, some years later, Arthas picked up the Frostmourne and became the Lich King, and then attacked Silvermoon to use the Sun Well to bring Kel'Thuzad back to life, killing about 90% of the elven population in the process. While all this happened, Kel'Thas was still in Dalaran. But, as soon as he found out 
he went home to regroup his people. Kalthos's dad died in the battle, which, understandably, made Kalthos pretty bummed out. So, he announced that his dad would be the last king of the elves, and that those remaining would now be called Blood Elves. So, technically, Kalthos was the first leader of the Blood Elves. Then, Kalthos went out to do what any leader of a country who needed to rebuild after losing a major war. He reforged his dad's sword, Fela Malorn, and sought to rekindle old allies, and to maybe find a cure for their newfound mana addiction following the destruction of the Sundwell. Tiny bit of history about the Blood Elves here, because it's very relevant to Kalthas' story. You see, the Blood Elves were founded by a section of Night Elves, who didn't want to give up using arcane magic after the War of the Ancients. So, they traveled halfway across the world and rebuilt a new empire around the Sun Whale that they created thanks to a vial of the old Whale of Eternity given to them by Illidan. The entire nation of Quel'Thalas was founded over not wanting to give up that Whale, which was now destroyed. Anyways, then a little time later, Kel'Thas runs into Tyrande and Maiev, randomly, and decided to help them out, since they were on a hunt to take down Illidan. During a battle with the undead, who were all over the place in this time period, Tyrande got swept away down a river after a bridge she was on collapsed. Later on, after finding Illidan, Malfurion, who had joined the party, blamed Illidan for Tyrande's death at the hands of the undead. To which Kalthas interjected with, Um, actually, she just got swept down a river and might still be alive. Malfurion, mad at Maiev for lying to him and for kind of being a crazy bitch, decided instead to team up with Illidan and look for Tyrande, as Illidan's naga would be very helpful in that kind of search. And Illidan, being actually a good guy the whole time, agreed. And that was that. And Kelthos left them to do their thing and went back to the human kingdoms in hopes of finding some support there. And that's where Garethos comes in. Now... Garethos is a piece of garbage and super racist. He hated the elves for not being human and didn't want them to join his army, which he was left in charge of by default. All the good generals and high-ranking political figures died after Arthas's betrayal, and he was just kind of the only high-ranking human in Lordaeron left. So he sent the Blood Elves to like build bases or something while he took his human army to the front lines and fought off the undead. During this task, they accepted the help of the Naga who came in and were like, Hey, you need boats to do this and we have boats. Then again they helped the Blood Elves after they were sent to fight a group of undead that vastly outnumbered them. Then the Naga took off and Garethos came back and said he saw them working with the Naga and said that was proof of treason because Naga are typically an evil race, and locked all the Blood Elves in the dungeons of Dalaran, waiting to be executed. Now, if you ever wondered why the Blood Elves aren't part of the Alliance, this is why. You can blame Garethos for that, and the fact that he nearly executed all of the remaining Elves. Anyways, eventually, Lady Vosh came in and freed Kalthos and his Blood Elves from prison, and took them all to Outland to look for Illidan who had gone missing. They eventually found Illidan being held captive by Maiev, and freed him. Kalthas then asked Illidan if he could actually help the Blood Elves overcome their mana addiction, to which Illidan said, There was no cure, but he could provide them with enough magical power that they wouldn't need to get over the addiction. So because of this, and because of how much help he got from the Naga, Kalthas pledged himself to Illidan's service and officially joined up with him. The three of them then went off to secure a foothold in Outlands, and to that end, they needed to close off all the portals in Outland, which there were a ton of. You see, the Legion kind of took control of Outlands because it was the perfect gateway point to open portals easily. Something about the planet being destroyed by a bunch of portals being opened at once just made it a really good place for portals to open in general. And while out hunting for portals, Kalthos came across a comma and is broken, being attacked by orcs. So, Kalthos saved Akama and learned about the Black Temple and Mactheridon, who was the leader of the demons in Outlands. Then Akama and the Broken joined the group, and Ilden led an assault on the Black Temple and captured Mactheridon. It was then that Kil'jaeden showed up and told Ilden to get back to Azeroth and kill the Lich King. Illidan, not wanting to upset Kil'jaeden just yet, 
agreed to follow the order again, and went back to Azeroth with Kalthos and the Naga, and then they went straight to Northrend. The plan was for Illidan to make it to the Frozen Throne before Arthas, and Kalthos and his Blood Elves attacked Arthas and his forces to buy time. And during the assault, Kalthos and Arthas ended up fighting each other one on one. Kalthos, being an incredibly powerful mage, decided to fight Arthas in melee with his weapon Fela Malorn. Arthas thought this was a terrible idea, and went to cut him in half along with his sword like he did to his father. Turns out the sword held up though. When elven blades are reforged, they come back stronger than before, and it was actually strong enough to stand up to the Frostmourne, to Arthas' surprise. Arthas then tried to taunt him, asking him if he was mad that he stole Jaina away, to which Kalthos replied, Jaina loathes you, Arthas. You sicken and disgust her. Anything she felt for you has long since turned into hatred. Which, surprisingly, ended up pissing Arthas off instead, which made him attack blindly for a bit until Kalthos was able to teleport away, after losing his blade in the battle, thinking he had bought Illidan more than enough time. But it wasn't. Arthas caught up with Illidan and then beat him in battle. Lady Vosh and Kalthos eventually found Illidan's body and took him back to Outlands. Illidan, knowing that Kil'jaeden would be coming for them, then started to build up an army to beat him and secretly started training his demon hunters. But Illidan also kept the demon hunters a secret from his allies, including Kalthas. Illidan tried teaching the Blood Elves how to siphon magic from artifacts, creatures, and the environment, but it wasn't enough for them. Kalthas eventually found out about the demon hunters and thought if they could use fell magic without falling under the Legion's sway, then so should he. So he convinced Illidan to teach him how to siphon fell magic, and started out only taking tiny bits and pieces of it at a time, but then he quickly became addicted. Fell magic is powerful stuff, some of the strongest forms of magic in the Warcraft universe, and Kalthas couldn't get enough of it, and it consumed him. Kalthas did want to save his people, but he then started growing paranoid about them, and secretly thought they saw him as a failure. He knew he should just cut his losses in Outland and return home, but he didn't want to show up empty-handed. It was then that Kill Jaden approached him. He told Kalthas that there were actually better ways to siphon fell magic, and that Illidan had taught his demon hunters the more refined techniques, and kept them from Kalthas because they were just pawns to be sacrificed in the fight with the Legion. Then he promised to show Kalthas the real way to siphon fell magic if he would turn on Illidan and join the Legion. To which Kalthas was like, yeah, no way. But this conversation did help fuel his paranoia nonetheless. Later on, Illidan noticed a Naru's arrival in Shatra City and thought they might be a potential threat to his war with the Legion. So he sent Kalthas and his Blood Elves to take the city. Kalthas asked if they could have the assistance of his demon hunters, and Illidan told him no, and also remained silent about why he couldn't use them. This pissed off Kalthas, but he tried to take the city anyway and sent a group of his best men to the city. Only, as soon as the elves got to the city, they threw down their weapons and joined the Naru, because their leader had a vision that the Naru were the key to saving their people. He then sent a message to Kalthas that he too should join the Naru, but got no reply. Kalthas was just the tiniest bit mad that a large portion of his army defected, and asked Illidan to retaliate against the Naru in his place. But Illidan just kind of ignored him, and didn't really do anything or care that Kalthas had failed. He was too busy with his demon hunters to care about anything else. This act all but convinced Kalthas that Kill Jaden was right, and that Illidan didn't really care about the Blood Elves at all. And Kalthas sought to not allow his men to be used as pawns again, not like what would happen with Garethos, and decided to side with Kill Jaden. Kalthas knew he should not trust the Legion and knew they were ultimately responsible for the Lich King and the destruction of his kingdom, but he also just, like, really wanted to learn more about fell magic. He was a total addict to that stuff, and this was the perfect excuse. 
So Kalthos told Illidan that he was going to Netherstorm to try and learn how to siphon the chaotic magic there, and that he would totally return. Illidan, preoccupied with his demon hunters, was like, yeah, sure, okay, whatever, and didn't really give it a second thought, and didn't really notice that they never returned until way later. While in Netherstorm, Kalthos found the Tempest Keep, which was a super advanced Naru ship, and overtook it with his newfound fell magic, and enslaved the Naru Maru. Kelthos finally had something to send back to his kingdom, and sent the Naru, as well as the knowledge of how to siphon magic from things, back to Azeroth, to his people in Silvermoon. Then Kelthos learned how to store mana from Netherstorm into magic cubes, and sent those back to Silvermoon as well, as alternative sources of powers for the Blood Elves to siphon. Kil'jaeden was all for this, as he had planned on using all of that magic to help summon himself into the world to invade Azeroth. Back in Silvermoon, though, Lorthamar was growing worried for Kel'thas, and wondered why he'd been away from home for so long. Sure, he had been getting messages from him, but he was doing weird things, and he was entirely on board with siphoning energy from Anaru. So, some stuff happened, Lorthamar joined the Horde to get allies, his Blood Elves made their way to Shatrath City and found out that Kel'thas had joined the Legion. Then they made their way to Netherstorm to try and put a stop to him, and it was Kel'thas' own Blood Elves who ended up killing him. Officially, anyway. Kel'thas was a raid boss in game available to both factions in the Burning Crusade. But Kel'thas' death was actually part of Kill Jaden's plan. As dead, he could more easily control him and had his men spirit away his soul into a new body, that was 100% loyal to Kil'jaeden and ready to do whatever he needed. So Kil'jaeden sent Kalthas back to Azeroth to prepare the sun well for his arrival. With most of the Blood Elves in Outland, Kalthas easily invaded Silvermoon and took control of the sun well. Then captured both the Naru Maru and the Avatar of the sun well, who had been hidden from him by Lorthamar this whole time, called Anvina. Plus, with the mana boxes he sent previously, he finally had enough materials to create the massive portal needed to bring Kil'jaeden into the world. The Blood Elves warned the Horde about what happened, and together with the Alliance, sent in an attack group to stop Kel'thas and his portal. The Horde was able to put a stop to Kel'thas for a second time, but not before he finished his task. The Alliance tried to stop Kil'jaeden but failed, and it was Anvina sacrificing herself that allowed them to push Kil'jaeden back. Then, Velen used the Heart of Maru, which purified the Sunwell and returned it back to nearly its former glory. So in the end, Kalthos did kind of provide the fix to his people's mana addiction, just probably not in the way he thought he would. Update. There was actually some new lore added to Kalthos after this video first went live. Kalthos ended up in Revendreth. He was taken by Sire Denathris personally to be experimented on, to amplify his pride to make more anima. You have to free him in a raid by healing him up. He then helps Revendreth players hunt down Kel'Thuzad, who he finds out is in Maldraxxus, another one of the zones of the Shadowlands. Later on, he teams up with Lady Vash to hunt down some Dreadlords. They talk and wonder about what happened to Illidan together. Vash reminds him that Illidan no longer had a mortal soul. You see, Illidan was never killed and was held captive by Maiev, where he was free during the Legion expansion. Illidan helped defeat the Legion and is currently alive guarding Sargeras' prison. Later, Kel'thas learns that Kel'Thuzad was permanently destroyed in the Sanctum of Domination raid. Kel remarks that he was frustrated that he wasn't there to kill him himself. He also remarks that his biggest regret in life was not being there for Silvermoon when it fell, and that it haunted him ever since. Kel'Thas was told by the Accuser that getting retribution would only be for himself, not his people who died and that he should seek redemption and not vengeance, as while he committed a lot of crimes in his life, failing to prevent Quathalas' fall was not one of them. She urged him to still repent, but to also forgive himself for letting his kingdom fall. Kel'thas eventually agrees to this, saying that he has a lot of work to do. Kel'thas ended up being an important NPC in the Shadowlands expansion, not as a villain, but as an ally to the player characters. Cthulhu's story starts off the same as all the other old gods. Cthulhu is merely a fragment of the Void Lord sent to random planets in hopes of corrupting a Titan's soul by mere chance. Cthulhu and his other buddy old gods managed to get lucky and find a planet with a world soul, and went about conquering it and started corrupting the hell out of it. 
Some things happened, and the Titans found out about the planet, and waged a war on the Old Gods for control of the planet of Azeroth. In the battle, one of the Old Gods was killed, and the other Old Gods were imprisoned. Once they found out that killing the other Old Gods would also destroy the planet anyway. So, lore-wise, you can't actually kill the Old Gods without also killing the planet itself. And this is merely the prelude to Cthulhu's story. Now, before I go on to the next stage of Cthulhu's story, I must first give a little backstory on the Akir. During a battle with some of the Titan Keepers, one of yogg Saron's top minions, known as the Cthraxi, was beaten nearly to death, but managed to run away and try to recover. Centuries later, a few trolls managed to find its hiding spot and woke it up. And as thanks, he killed all the trolls in the area. And discovered a vast troll empire had sprung up in the time that he had been asleep. So, in order to spite them because he was just a huge dick and thought the old gods would like it, he sent out a psychic signal to all of the submerged Akir, who had been hiding since the end of the War of the Titans, and formed them into an army to wipe out the troll empires. This attack on the trolls is what finally united the separated tribes, and turned into a centuries-long war in which the Cthraxi was eventually killed, and the Akir were then hunted into extinction. So the Akir that did manage to survive hid in three corners of the world, and the Akir that decided to hide in Silithus were eventually morphed into the Karaji by Cthun, and became the center force of Cthun's army. Which then leads into the War of the Shifting Sands. Many thousands of years later, some night elves thought it would be a neat idea to try to turn the desert of Silithus into a lush green forest. So they sent out a scouting party to survey the land, led by Valsten Staghelm, and kinda accidentally awoke the Karaji who had been sleeping, with Cthun also giving them a bigger push and sending them all into a murderous rampage. The Night Elves, realizing what kind of threat they could pose, immediately set out to try and contain the Karaji to the deserts before they could spread out across the continent, with Fandral Staghelm in charge of the operation. But the Night Elf army was no match for the near unlimited amount of bugs pouring out of Silithus. So Fandral went to ask the nearby bronze dragons for help to contain the threat, but the bronze dragons declined help and just kind of told the Night Elves to handle it themselves. Then, during a battle, a band of Karaji managed to surround a base held up by Volstan Staghelm, and took him prisoner. They then brought him in front of the Night Elf army, including his dad, Fandral Staghelm, and tore him to pieces. Seeing his son killed in front of him completely destroyed his will to fight, and the Karaji managed to push back the elves and flood into neighboring zones, including Tenaris. Once the Karaji attacked the Caverns of Time, the Bronze Dragons finally took them as a real threat and joined the Night Elves' fight, and even got the aid of three of the other Dragon Flights as well. And with the combined might of the entire Night Elf army and four of the Dragon Aspects in their flights, they only managed to push them back to Silithus and were still having a hard time with them. For as one of the Bronze Dragons said, for every 50 of the insects that were annihilated by his breath, 100 would be waiting to take their place. So instead of trying to eliminate them completely, they instead sought to try and contain them inside the city of Ankaraj. So with one last major push, and with all of the druids working together on one spell, and with the help of the bronze dragons, they managed to summon a giant barrier around the city and close it off from the outside world. All the Karaji that were outside the barrier were then quickly dealt with, and the bronze dragon Anacronus created the Scarab Gong, and the Scepter of the Shifting Sands, which would allow them to reopen the city should they ever need to in the future to go in and deal with the problem of the Karaji more permanently. The bronze dragon then gave the Scepter to Fandral, who immediately destroyed it, shattering it into pieces because he was mad at the bronze dragons for not helping out earlier, before his son was killed. Fandral would then go on to be involved in the resurrection of the Emerald Nightmare, and then become the second to last boss in the Cataclysm Firelands raid, when he threw in his lot with Ragnaros. All because he kinda went crazy after watching his son die. And that was the end of the threat of Cthulhu for about a thousand years. 
before the second War of the Shifting Sands took place within Vanilla WoW's timeline. You see, some of the Karanji had found out how to get outside the barrier and were causing havoc in Kalimdor. Anacronus, the Bronze Dragon, then decided it was time to finally, more permanently deal with the Karaji threat, and asked heroes of both the Alliance and Horde to reopen the gate. So, with the combined forces of the Alliance and Horde, in a rare instance of them working directly together, created a force called the Might of Kalimdor, with Varrock Saurfang at the lead position of Supreme Commander, and opened the gates and went inside the city to deal with Cthulhu directly. And according to lore, it was thanks to a band of heroes that Cthulhu was finally defeated, and the Karaji finally calmed down a bit, as they're generally only really aggressive when an old god is sending them into a frenzy. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this is one of the few times in game where a villain is defeated and credit is given to the players in game. Now, despite the fact that it's said Cthulhu was killed during the events of the second War of the Shifting Sands, it's heavily speculated whether or not Cthulhu actually died or not. Sure, he might be, quotation marks, dead, but is he dead dead? His lore after this point is a little murky, and probably won't be cleared up until the third Chronicle book comes out. So, as it stands now, Cthulhu is defeated, that much is sure, and Cho'Gall attempted to resurrect him, only in-game, he doesn't do a very good job and is eventually killed on the other side of the world in the Bastion of Twilight. And in the comics, he's a little bit more successful, but I wouldn't count the comics as canon since they tend to disregard a lot that happens in them. Not everything, mind you. They absolutely bring in some lore from the comics randomly, like how they brought in Meryl, Felstorm, and Legion with the Mage Order Hall and a few other things. But as it stands now... I think we just defeated a portion of Cthulhu, and more readily contained him in his prison. And his prison might have been weakened a little bit after the whole Sargeras sword stabbing incident. For you see, after the events of the Legion expansion, Sargeras stabs his giant sword into the heart of Silithus before being imprisoned by the Titans. At this point in time, as of making this video, we don't really know what this means. But seeing as it happened so close to Cthulhu's prison, and the murky nature behind what Blizzard plans to do with Cthulhu's story, as they have neither closed it off completely, nor expanded on it much, Cthulhu might have a role to play later on in WoW's story. So, I think this is a good place to end this video for now. Murlocs themselves are an intelligent humanoid species with their own language, and are more than capable of using tools and even congregate into large groups. All of these things would point to an eventual advanced civilization, if it wasn't for the fact that Murlocs have no interest in that. Clopper Whizbang from the Explorers League did a study on Murlocs, and found while they are somewhat intelligent, if a little stupid when compared to other sentient races, the reason why they're so primitive is because they have no curiosity when it comes to new technologies, which is not the norm when it comes to more advanced species. So basically, they're just kinda dumb and very not curious about the world. The Murlocs are also a somewhat violent race and have many different reasons for why they attack people. One of the reasons is that they worship basically anything that is stronger than them. So if there's a gigantic shark that beats some of them in battle, they might worship it as their god until a bigger sea creature comes along and kills that shark, in which case that new sea creature will be their new god. In Warcraft 3, a group of murlocs worshipped a Naga Sea Witch, who was a powerful spellcaster, and the murlocs abducted Vol'jin's father and sacrificed him to the Sea Witch, and the murlocs were almost successful in completely wiping out the Darkspear tribe, until Thrall came in and saved the day with his band of orcs. So murlocs have played pretty important roles in WoW's lore, but there aren't very many notable singular murlocs. Probably one of the more infamous murlocs is Old Murkai, who is an elite murloc on the shores of Westfall, who was the objective of a low-level kill quest, and surrounded by other murlocs, which meant he caused the death of a lot of low-level players. The final boss of the Wailing Caverns dungeon was a murloc named Mutinus the Devourer. After clearing the dungeon, you can talk to one of the druids at the entrance in order to perform a ritual to cleanse the caverns of the Nightmare. 
where you have to fight the worst nightmare of the druid, Narlex. And it turned out his worst nightmare was Murlocs. In another dungeon, located in the Black Fathom Deeps, was a Murloc named Galihast, who heard whispers from the old gods and decided, man, old gods sure are strong, I should totally worship them, and then went into a cave full of Twilight Hammer cultists, and then just started killing all of them with his twin swords. And the Twilight cultists were so impressed by both his devotion to the old gods and his brutality that they allowed him to stay. And he built his own shrine in a cave off to the side in order to offer his own sacrifices and receive blessings from the ominous presence in the ruins. But then later on, a faceless one named Subjugator Korul was summoned by the Twilight Hammer and sent into the cave to kill everything that wasn't under their direct control, which included the Wild Murloc. So the Faithless One killed Galahast and then took control over his murlocs, while hanging up Galahast's body as proof of his dominance over the other murlocs. And then there's Captain Cookie, a murloc who became the captain of the Defy's Juggernaut, a gigantic ship located in the Dead Mines. Now, the way Cookie became captain of the ship was one day, after the previous captain was killed, he decided to start calling himself the new captain, and anyone who disagreed with him came down with the mysterious but severe case of food poisoning. After adventurers go into the dead mines and kill everyone in there, Captain Cookie manages to escape and went to Talador and is the inventor of the Legion Chili food item from Warlords of Draenor. And for the most part, these are all of the named villain murlocs in the game. There are a few murlocs that are much more friendly, like Murky and Sir Finley Murgleton, a murloc from the Explorers League who's even able to speak common, but this is a villain-centric series, so we won't be talking about those two. Now, Varimothris' first appearance comes after Archimonde is summoned into Azeroth by Kel'Thuzad. And Archimonde immediately takes control of the Scourge and places them in the control of the three Dreadlords. One of whom is Varimothris. While Archimonde went off to Mount Hyjal to try and steal the magic from the World Tree, the three Dreadlords just kind of hanged out in Lordaeron, until Arthas showed up to tell them that Archimonde was dead. The Dreadlords then ran away, as Arthas was too much for them to handle, and escaped to the Plaguelands to plot their next move. Varimothris had a plan for retaking the city from Arthas. He knew the hold Arthas had over the undead was weakening, so he secretly met up with Sylvanas, who at the time was one of Arthas' most used servants, and told her that the Lich King's power was weakened to the point that she should be able to rebel against Arthas and that he and his other dreadlords would cause a commotion to separate Arthas from his army. Sylvanas, very eager for revenge, gladly accepted the offer and set up an ambush to kill Arthas the moment he was alone. And true to his word, Varimothris set the plan in motion perfectly, and Sylvanas was moments from killing Arthas when Kel'Thuzad came in and single-handedly saved his life. But all of this was still a net plus to Varimothris' plan as Arthas was forced to return to Northrend. More and more undead were abandoning the Scourge and joining Sylvanas' army, and Kel'Thuzad was forced to retreat to the Plaguelands with what little army he had left. Varimothris then went to Sylvanas again and offered her and her people a place in his army, as they planned on taking over the whole world. Sylvanas refused, as she didn't want to give away her freedom again after just getting it back. Varimothras then told her that that made her an enemy of the Burning Legion, and they do best well to stay out of his way. Sylvanas then went to work and gathered all of her strong undead, and then had her banshees possess the strongest thing she could find, and ordered an attack on Varimothras and his men, easily and quickly defeating him. Right before Sylvanas was going to execute Varimothras, he begged for his life, saying he could be of use to her and he knew the other Dreadlord's plans and locations. Sylvanas agreed that this would indeed be very useful information to have, as the other Dreadlords would grow more weary of her after the defeat of Varimothris. So Sylvanas and Varimothris teamed up, and worked together to reclaim the rest of Lordaeron from the other Dreadlords. Their first target was Dathorok, who had enslaved a large number of human soldiers. So, utilizing similar tactics, Sylvanas had her banshees possess a number of human scouts and infiltrate his base. Then, while they all slept, she quickly had his bases destroyed one after another, and before they realized what happened, Sylvanas had Deathrock killed, which freed the humans from his mind control. 
The leader of this human army, Garethos, then, reluctantly, agreed to work with Sylvanas to reclaim Lordaeron. With Balnazar on full alert after the other two dreadlords were defeated so quickly, Sylvanas attacked Lordaeron on two sides with hers and the human army. Ultimately, this attack was too much for Balnazar to overcome, and he was defeated in a timely manner as well. But before killing him, Sylvanas instead ordered Varimothris to deal the killing blow. Varimothris hesitated though, and told Sylvanas that it was forbidden for dreadlords to kill one another. Sylvanas told him that she needed one last test of his loyalty. So Varimothris eventually killed Balnazar. Garethos then told Sylvanas to get out of his city, to which Sylvanas told Varimothris to kill him too, which he did with much less hesitation. Sylvanas then declared that her and her people would be called the Forsaken from now on, and her and Varimothris went to work in building the Undercity. Sylvanas and Varimothris ruled the Forsaken with almost equal power in its early days. There was a rumor common amongst the Forsaken that there were two factions in Undercity. Those loyal to Sylvanas and those who served Varimothris. Although, officially, he was directly under Sylvanas in the chain of command. And Varimothris absolutely was working the whole time to try and take control of the Undercity for himself. Firstly, he kept in contact with Balnazar, who had actually faked his death when Varimothris was ordered to kill him, and went off and took control of the Scarlet Crusade. The Scarlet Crusade was in constant war with all undead, whether or not they were scourged or forsaken, and Varimothris was in charge of dealing with the Scarlet Crusade threat to Undercity. So with him working directly with both sides of the conflict, it was more or less a distraction to make it seem like he was loyal and trying to help. But actually, he was using the conflicts as a way to slowly gather his faction and prepare for a rebellion. Then, many years later, the Lich King finally woke back up and launched a second Scourge invasion across the world with a new plague. Luckily though, one of Sylvanas' apothecaries named Putris was able to find a cure to this plague, and with his help, they successfully stopped the second Scourge invasion before it could get too out of hand. For finding a cure to the plague, Putris was promoted to the Grand Apothecary, and even got to accompany Sylvanas to a meeting with all the Horde leaders to discuss how to deal with the Scourge, which would lead to the Northrend campaign. He was also tasked with perfecting the Forsaken Blight, a chemical weapon that the Forsaken secretly use all the time but pretend not to. That is potent enough to work on both the living and undead. And with Putris in charge of the chemical division, he was able to perfect the new blight and got it ready for use in the upcoming war with the Lich King. Putris, however, was loyal to Varimothris. With the majority of the Horde forces, as well as Sylvanas and Northren, and Putris in charge of the new super deadly and efficient chemical weapon, the timing was perfect for Varimothris' plan to go into action. So, during the Wrathgate, with both the Alliance and Horde working together to take out the Lich King, all three being enemies of Varimothris, they were all in a nice, convenient location to unleash the new plague and deal a crippling blow to everyone at once. So, Putris rolled out his catapults and unleashed the plague, killing all the Alliance and Horde soldiers caught in the explosions, as well as weakening the Lich King and causing him to retreat. At the same time, Varimothris took control of the Undercity and blocked it off while he attempted to summon a Legion army to assist him. What Varimothris probably didn't plan on was just how much the Wrathgate disaster pissed off both factions. Both the Alliance and Horde immediately returned to Undercity and fought through the city to reclaim it, with the Horde going in the front and the Alliance through the back. Varimothris was trying his best to summon... well something into Azeroth? We don't actually know for sure, but it might have been some version of Sargeras. But whatever the case, Thrall and Sylvanas manage to kill him before he succeeds. Then, back in the Twisting Nether, as punishment for failing in Undercity, Varimothris was sent to the Sisters of Shivara for torture, and was presumably tortured non-stop until the Army of Light broke into Antorus and faced him. Upon facing the Horde or Alliance, he has a different speech for both of them. For Alliance players, he will basically tell them that she has already planted the seeds of their downfall, with she 
most likely referring to Sylvanas. For Horde players, he will tell them that Sylvanas probably tricked them into giving her the title of Warchief willingly. Also, if he wipes the group, one of his lines is, Better that you died here, where she cannot claim you. All of which to show that Vari Mothris holds Sylvanas in very high regard, and probably knows about some plan that she made from way back when they still worked together. But, since he was deep in the Twisting Nether when he was killed for the second time, he is now dead dead, which marks the end of the story of Vari Mothris. Update. We finally know what Sylvanas' plans were. Turns out Sylvanas was working with a jailer to break the cycle of death and life. Specifically because Sylvanas thought it was messed up how people were judged for things that weren't their fault in life. The Dreadlords secretly worked for the jailer, but they didn't always know all of his plans. In the Sylvanas novel, she notes that when the Wrathgate incident happened, she knew they were up to something, but was annoyed that they chose that moment to enact their plan. So, based on these timelines and series of events, we can conclude that Varimothris didn't actually know what Sylvanas was planning until after he died, and probably got some info from the other Dreadlords in the Nether, since Sylvanas didn't meet the Jailer until after he was killed on Azeroth. So his cryptic lines in Antorus was just info he got after the fact, or maybe he was privy to some vague plan to use her, as the Jailer had scouted out Sylvanas beforehand. Either way, he was basically used as a way to tease some of Sylvanas' future plot points coming up two expansions after the fact. The Headless Horseman was once a paladin of the Silver Hand named Thomas Thompson, and was there when Arthas called for the calling of Stratholme. Thomas refused the order along with Uther, and went to go protect a nearby local town instead, as the whole countryside was having a scourge problem. But the town he was protecting was sent infected food by Baron Rivendare, a future Four Horsemen, and someone Thomas thought he could trust. And the people he was protecting turned on him as they became mindless ghouls, and he was forced to kill them. So Thomas reported the incident to his fellow paladins, and was very distraught over the betrayal of Rivendare. So the paladin sent him back home to spend some time with his family so he could recover. Then, when Uther was killed, a call was made for all remaining members of the Silver Hand to come together to help fight the Scourge. So, Sir Thomas personally put his family on a boat that would sail to Kalimdor with Jaina, safe from the plague and the Scourge. Then, for the next four years after, he helped fight the Scourge, and eventually becomes a member of the Scarlet Crusade, along with the remaining members of the Silver Hand. The Scarlet Crusade at this time was ruled by a Dreadlord, who convinced all of his followers that even normal, healthy-looking people could secretly be Scourge in disguise. So, the Scarlet Crusade went out, purging villages of normal people if they thought they were suspicious. While Sir Thomas was participating in purging a village, he recognizes his daughter right as he kills her, and realized he had killed his wife as well, even though they were supposed to be on another continent. Turns out that there was a storm that forced the boat to turn back, and his family spent their time in this village instead of heading back to Kalimdor. Sir Thomas, ever the family man, goes crazy after finding out he killed his own family and gets locked up by the Scarlet Crusade. While locked up, he cries and howls and would chant creepy rhymes. He really grew fond of rhymes. The Scarlet Crusade thought he could still be useful if sent loose on the Scourge, though, so they put him into battle. But while he did kill the Scourge, he also started killing other members of the Scarlet Crusade, because to him, Everyone was a scourge in disguise. So, the crusade cut off his head to stop his rampage. Later, the dreadlord in charge of the crusade stole his body and raised him as a death knight on Hollow's End, as part of one of his experiments. And now, he goes around killing people because he thinks everyone is evil, and he's just being the good guy trying to stop them. All while rhyming the entire time. Then, when players kill him in the Scarlet Monastery, Thomas will appear in his human form as a ghost, and will say, For ages I was lost. Now, finally, I see how dark my soul had become. Meaning, he gained his lost sanity back in death, and was able to pass on peacefully. Kalthuzad was a top-ranking member in Dalaran, and a very accomplished mage, who was both rich and powerful. But, he had an obsession with necromancy, and was always experimenting with bringing rats back to life. He was also frustrated that he couldn't do more than just bring rats back to life, and that's why he answered the Lich King's summon. 
You see, at this time, the Lich King was just Ner'zhul bound to the armor at the Frozen Throne, and he was tasked with building an undead army. So he sent out a psychic message to anyone who was in tune with the Dark Arts to come to Northrend and meet with him if they wanted to learn more, which was perfect for Kel'Thuzad, whose life goal was to learn more about necromancy. It just so happened that, also, around the same time, the Kirin Tor found out about his experiments with bringing rats back to life, and told him to cut it out. So instead, he just sold all of his stuff and decided to head north. When he reached Northren, he came across Nerubians, who were very obviously undead, which greatly excited him. He had a hard enough time bringing rodents back to life, and he was one of the top mages in Dalaran. And then, here we have these giant bug creatures who could move and think on their own, walking about in service to the Lich King. Kel'Thuzad then eventually met with the new Barak, the leader of the Nerubians, and was given a nice little tour of Naxxaramas, since they had been expecting some new recruits to show up. While inside Naxxaramas, Kel'Thuzad was shown the plague for the first time, the stuff that would kill people and then turn them undead and loyal to the Lich King, and saw it used on a sick woman who immediately killed and ate her husband after turning into a zombie. The sight of this freaked Kel'Thuzad out so much that he teleported out of Naxxaramas to throw up. Of course, he was followed outside, and after getting over the initial shock, he decided that he was kind of into it, and decided to meet up with the Lich King anyway. So Kel'Thuzad was brought before the Lich King and sworn to work for him and do whatever. And the Lich King was like, alright, sounds good. Don't ever betray me though. And then gave him the power he wanted. Plus, sent him out on a mission to create the Cult of the Dam and to infect the Kingdom of Lordaeron with the plague. So Kel'Thuzad went back to Lordaeron and tried his best to convert the people of the land into his new death cult that was all about destroying all life on Azeroth in return for immortality, and Kel'Thuzad had a much easier time than he thought he would finding followers. So for the next few years, he went around recruiting people and preparing the plague. Finally, once the Lich King thought Kel'Thuzad had enough followers, he gave them the plague to be set in cultist-controlled villages and to unleash it on the population. This chemical warfare of poisoning people to death who would then immediately be rezzed in service to the Lich King also worked surprisingly well, and there was a huge outbreak of undead everywhere, thanks to Kel'Thuzad. And then this is where Arthas enters the picture. You see, on one of Kel'Thuzad's outings of spreading the plague, he was caught by Arthas and Jaina and ran away. But Arthas chased him down and killed him. But not before Kel'Thuzad could tell him about the impending tragedy that would befall Stratholm. So Arthas went out and did his thing. Uh, more info on this time period will be explained in the Arthas video, but suffice to say, Arthas went out, obtained the Frostmore, and became part of the Lich King, came back to his hometown, caused a bunch of mayhem, and finally went out in search for Kel'Thuzad's body. Once he was found, Kel'Thuzad told Arthas that the Dreadlords he was working with were not to be trusted, and his real mission was to help free Ner'zhul from the Legion. But first he'd need his body back. So Arthas went out and waged war with Silver Moon City, and killed about 90% of the High Elven population, all to use the Sunwell to bring Kel'Thuzad back to life. This was probably one of the single most important events to the lore of the Blood Elves and Sylvanas, but it's just kind of a footnote for Kel'Thuzad. After being brought back to life, he told Arthas the whole plan. Basically, the Lich King Ner'zhul was in service to the Burning Legion, and the whole thing with the Scourge was just to weaken the world before the Burning Legion could launch an invasion. Since he succeeded in his first part, it was time for him to go into part two of summoning the Legion. But surprise, surprise, all of this was actually just a clever ruse by Ner'zhul to free himself from the Legion's control. You see, Ner'zhul pretended to help the Legion so that the Legion would slowly, over time, give him more and more control and freedom. And once he was sufficiently self-sufficient, and no longer being watched over by the Dreadlords, 
He planned to rebel and take his freedom back. And Kel'Thuzad was all about helping him do this. Like, to a fanatical degree. As he was basically the guy who did all of the legwork for the Lich King. So part two of his plan was to go to Dalaran with Arthas and steal the Book of Medivh. Which would allow them to summon Archimon into the world. And during this invasion on Dalaran, Arthas managed to kill Antonidas, the leader of the mages of Dalaran, and Jaina's teacher. Pretty important dude, but then again, that's kind of Arthas' deal, killing a crap ton of important lore characters. After a successful invasion of Dalaran, Kel'Thuzad got the Book of Medivh and summoned Archimon into the world. Archimon then destroyed the city of Dalaran, and gave control of the Scourge to the Dreadlords. With this, it was time to enact the final part of the Lich King's plan. With the demons focused on their conquest of the world, and the unstoppable Scourge army now in control of the Legion as well, the Legion was finally turning a blind eye to the Lich King, which is what he needed in order to free himself and become self-sufficient. So Kel'Thuzad told Arthas what he needed to do in order to help the people of the world win against the Legion. Which, like everything else in Ner'zhul's plan, was incredibly convoluted and involved helping Elden get the Skull of Gul'dan so he'd kill the final Dreadlord who was keeping him in check. While Arthas went out and did his thing, Kel'Thuzad just waited for him to return in Lordaeron with the Banshee Sylvanas. After the Legion was defeated, Arthas eventually came back and told Kel'Thuzad that he was the king now and should be addressed as such. Kel'Thuzad who I might stress here was like super loyal to the Lich King, was all for this, as Arthas was the Lich King's chosen champion and was incredibly happy to see him return. So with the Legion invasion on Azeroth over, Kel'Thuzad and Arthas chased the remaining Dreadlords off and worked on rebuilding the Scourge army. But Arthas started suffering seizures and began weakening. Turns out he'd been away from Northrend for too long and really needed to go back to the Frozen Throne to recharge. Of course, this made Kel'Thuzad really anxious and worried. So he prepared ships and transport back to Northrun right away. But during this time, the Dreadlords came back and ambushed them, and in the ambush, separated Arthas from Kel'Thuzad. Kel'Thuzad then told Arthas to meet up in the forest and to escape the city, and worked on freeing himself from the city as well. Kel'Thuzad eventually managed to get out of the city, only to find Arthas poisoned and surrounded by Sylvanas and her banshees. He then immediately killed all of Sylvanas' banshees and chased her off, saving Arthas' life. It was then that Arthas thanked Kel'Thuzad and called him his best friend. The only time the Lich King Arthas called anyone a friend or equal, mind you. This was kind of a big deal. Then Arthas went off to Northrend to recover, and Kel'Thuzad was left in charge of watching over the land while he was gone. Kel'Thuzad swore to uphold his legacy at any cost, and went to the eastern plague lands to rule from Naxxramas. From Nax, Kel'Thuzad went back to work in spreading the plague across Azeroth. Only this time, everyone was aware of it and actively fought back, so it didn't go anywhere near as smoothly as the first time. But he was having some middling success. During the years Kel'Thuzad was at his work, someone had created a special sword that was super effective at killing his undead minions, and could be a real threat to him. This sword, of course, was the Ashbringer, and Kel'Thuzad set out on a mission to either destroy it or claim it for himself. So with the help of Balnazar, the Dreadlord, who was friendly now for some reason. Uh, I should mention Balnazar was one of the Dreadlords who attacked him in Arthas when he was weak, but you know, whatever. They're working together now, and the Dreadlord was able to trick the wielder of the Ashbringer's son to kill his father with the sword. Since the sword is an embodiment of holy light, being used in such an evil manner corrupted the sword and turned it into the corrupted Ashbringer. Kel'Thuzad then grabbed Alexandros Morgrain's body, the wielder of the Ashbringer, turned him into a Death Knight, and gave him the corrupted Ashbringer. Then, sometime later, Darion Morgrain, another one of Alexandros' sons, managed to stage a successful attack into Naxxramas, 
and kill his Death Knight father and steal the sword back. Kel'Thuzad then launched an attack on Light Hope's chapel, where Darien was located with the Ashbringer. When Darien plunged the sword into his heart, killing himself, releasing the captured soul of his father, and causing a massive explosion that killed all of the lesser undead in the area, immediately stopping the invasion. After the battle was over and the dust settled, Kel'Thuzad went in and turned Darien into a death knight and gave him the corrupted Ashbringer. With a powerful item like the Ashbringer in his control, he then set out to collect the pieces of a dash, the legendary staff that Medivh used. And he had pretty much most of the staff in his control, as when players go through Nax in Vanilla WoW, they can collect most of the parts needed to construct it from Nax, with a few parts being collected from elsewhere, and the base being a drop from Cthulhu. And speaking of Vanilla WoW, this is when Kel'Thuzad came to his second death. With the combined might of the Scarlet Crusade, Argent Dawn, and the forces of the Horde and Alliance constantly attacking his forces and Plaguelands, Kel'Thuzad's army was severely diminished, and he was forced to retreat into Naxxramas. Players then managed to break through the defenses of Nax and launched a successful attack on Kel'Thuzad, who ended up being the final boss of Classic WoW, killing him and obtaining his phylactery. Now, what makes liches so powerful is the fact that they're basically immortal. If they die, they will simply just respawn at their phylactery, eventually. So any good lich will hide their phylactery somewhere safe, where no one could find it. But Kel'Thuzad carried his in his pocket for some reason. But luckily, one of Kel'Thuzad's followers had managed to infiltrate the Argent Dawn and tricks players into giving him the phylactery, which he then promptly runs off to Northrend and allows Kel'Thuzad to reform. After reforming, Kel'Thuzad started helping out the Lich King in Northrend and is seen in the Boren Tundra preparing some undead troops. He was also given control of Naxxramas once again, only this time in Dragonblight. And this time, the Horde and Alliance, lore-wise, were a lot more organized and powerful, and managed to sweep through Naxxramas once again, killing Kel'Thuzad for a third time. And this time, he didn't actually carry his phylactery on him. So, technically, lore-wise, Kel'Thuzad is still alive somewhere. Until information on his phylactery is found, He's basically assumed alive and in hiding somewhere, and could be reintroduced in the future. Update. We found out what happened to his phylactery. Sire Denathus reached out to Kel'Thuzad after the events of the Wrath of the Lich King and convinced him to work with the Jailer. They were able to trick the Arbiter to send him to Maldraxxus to blend in. He was able to rise to a high position in Maldraxxus and started turning the major houses against each other so their power would crumble. He was actually incredibly successful at this until the player character reveals all of his plans. Later on, he's a raid boss in the Sect of Domination, where he's killed by the player characters and his phylactery is also destroyed along with him. Then, the remains of his power were used by Bolvar to open the way to the Sylvanas fight. So Kel'Thuzad is dead dead, as his final words were a disbelief that death did not answer his call. Yogg-Saron's story starts off with the Void Lords. The Void Lords wanted to corrupt Titans, but found out they couldn't. So instead, they settled on trying to corrupt Titans before they woke up. But they couldn't tell a normal planet apart from a Titan one. So they just randomly flung pieces of themselves throughout the universe to hit planets and corrupt them, with the hope that at least one of them might be a sleeping Titan. This shotgun approach was bound to work at least once, and that's all they needed. For if they succeeded one time, a void power titan would be the most powerful being in existence. Many times more powerful than normal titans, and would absolutely be the end of the universe. The thought of one of these void titans becoming a reality is what scared Sargeras into creating the Burning Legion. And these random pieces of void lords thrown onto planets are what we know as the Old Gods, and also how yogg saron was born. Before Yogg and the other old gods crashed into Azeroth, Azeroth was already in a constant state of chaos, with the four elemental lords fighting each other for control of the planet. But with the threat of the old gods, the four elemental lords worked together for the first time in history to try and fend off a common enemy. But they did not succeed, 
No matter how many of the old god minions they took out, new ones would just be born to replace them faster than they could be killed, until eventually they just got overwhelmed. After which, the old gods managed to enslave the elemental lords and turn them into their own minions. Then sometime later, Agrimar, one of the titans, found Azeroth and noticed that Azeroth was not only a titan, but possibly the most powerful titan to date. And despite the fact that its surface was covered by old gods, it was still uncorrupted. So Agrimar went back to the other titans and formed a plan to stop the corruption before it spread too far. Since the titans themselves were too big to directly help the planet without accidentally killing the titan soul, they instead built an army of metal and stone titan forge. And then each titan gave a few of the titan forge some of their own powers, so they could lead the titan forge in the upcoming war with the old gods. The war between the titans and the old gods. At the start of the war, the titan forge came down and just decimated the minions of the old gods. The titan forge were so efficient at killing that the old gods just couldn't create more than were being killed fast enough, like they did with their fight against the elemental lords. So instead, they called upon the elemental lords to fight for them. Tyr and Odin fought Ragnaros, the Fire Lord, eventually pushing him back into a volcano and containing him. Arcadus and Freya fought Therisane and trapped her in unbreakable roots. Ra, Thorm, and Hodir fought Alakir and just beat him at his own game and used wind and lightning magic to contain him in his throne. Loken and Mimiron fought Neptulon. Loken would freeze his water elementals while Mimiron created a device to imprison him. Then Ra used the Fist of Ra Den to create the elemental planes to contain the elementals so they wouldn't just reform and come back. With the elementals taken care of, the Titan Keepers could focus on the old gods again and mounted an attack on the strongest old god, Yasharaj. But it was a little too much for the Titan Keepers to handle. So Amon Thul, one of the Titans himself, ripped Yasharaj out of the planet, killing him. And realizing that the old gods had so infused their bodies with the planet that killing them would also kill Azeroth. So instead, they turned their attention towards imprisonment. The Titan Keepers easily imprisoned both Inzoth and Cthun, but had a much harder time with Yogg. You see, Yog saron had created a super minion called the Cthraxi, while the Keepers fought the other old gods. And the Cthraxi was a giant beast, far stronger than the Titan Forge, and a lot more intelligent than anything they'd created since. The Cthraxi nearly wiped out the Titan Forge before the Keeper showed up. Even the Titan Keepers had a hard time dealing with the Cthraxi. So Odin came up with a plan to have Loken use an illusion spell to trick the Cthraxi into thinking their allies were their enemies. With yogg men fighting each other, Odin ran in and used the confusion to diminish their numbers, with the other Titan Keepers eventually helping out. With this final push, yogg was defeated and locked in a prison known as Old War. Gog's story doesn't pick up again until sometime after the war with the Titans. While locked away in his prison, yogg managed to regain some power and control to affect the physical world in subtle ways to eventually plan his escape. One of his first plans was to corrupt the Forge of Wills, a device in Ulduar used to create new Titan Forge, and Yogg wanted to afflict it with the Curse of Flesh. The Curse of Flesh would weaken the Titan Forge bodies by turning them from stone or metal into flesh. The Curse of Flesh is pretty self-explanatory. As stone or metal creatures, the Titan Forge can live forever and are pretty durable. As meaty, fleshy things, they are a lot easier to kill. And Yogg would set it so that the new Titan born created from the Forge would spread the curse to other ones as well. But in order to pull this off, Yogg worked towards turning the Keeper Loken to his side. Yogg tried to break him by sending his usual madness whispers to his dreams and stuff, but Loken just kind of brushed it all aside. But Yogg did hit upon a jackpot by focusing on Loken, because as it turned out, Loken was having an affair with Sif, who was the wife of Thorum, another Titan Keeper. So Yogg pushed this angle, and convinced Loken to go all in with Sif and try and let them be together. But Sif knew that a scandal like that might be bad for the Titan Keepers who all needed to work together, and could even cause a civil war. So she eventually broke things off, 
But in a fit of rage, Loken ended up killing Sif. And then coincidentally, the ghost of Sif appeared immediately right in front of Loken and told him that she forgave him for her death, but that they needed to work quickly to cover it up, lest war break out. Of course, this ghost wasn't actually Sif, it was Yogg. He finally had his direct line of manipulation to get Loken to do what he wanted. First, he told Loken to blame Sif's death on the Ice Giants, which caused a massive war between the Storm and Ice Giants. Next, he told Loken to use the Forge of Wills to create a massive army of his own. You know, to protect himself from those crazy Ice and Storm Giants fighting each other. Then, Loken told Thorm that his war was silly and emotion-fueled, that Sif would be ashamed at what he had done, which caused Thorm to agree and voluntarily go into exile. Then Loken used his new army to subdue all the remaining giants and take control. While all this was going on, Yogg had also succeeded in corrupting the Forge of Souls as the spirit of Sif, and the Curse of Flesh was spread to all of the new army Loken had created, and anyone who came into contact with his new army. Loken eventually found out that the Sif spirit was an illusion made by Yogg Saron, and became obsessed with covering up his mistake. And in order to do so, he had to take out all of the other Titan Keepers. First, he went after Odin by promising to free Helia from her being a Valkyrie if she could lock Odin in his Halls of Valor, which she did. Next, he sabotaged Mimiron's lab to have him killed in what would look like an accident. Luckily, his Mecha Gnomes managed to save him after the accident, but Mimiron lost his mind in the process. Then Loki went after and attacked Freya, and after her defeat, Yogg pulled her into Olduard to work on a garden to keep her busy for some reason. At the same time as his attack on Freya, Loken also sent a group to attack Hodir that consisted of fire giants to completely counter his frost giants. The remaining two titan keepers, Tyr and Arcadus, saw the attack on Hodir and went into hiding. Loken was then worried that Ra might come up from the south and see what happened to the other titan keepers. So he sent a small force of his own men down to Oldham to check up on him. Upon investigation, it turns out Ra went missing and the Titan Forge didn't know where he went. And it was this meeting with Loken's men that affected the Mogu, Tolvir, and the Anubisaths to the Curse of Flesh. With all the other Titan Keepers dealt with, Loken shut down the Forge of Wills and named himself as the new Prime Designate and waited in Ulduar worried that one day Algalon would come back to Azeroth and punish him. But with Loken's successful takeover of Olduvar, Yogg was free to do pretty much whatever he wanted to try and free himself, as he no longer had to worry about the Titan Keeper stopping him. Then Yogg's story here on out kinda gets fragmented until his eventual downfall. Yogg managed to corrupt the Tree of Life in Grizzly Hills named Vordrasil until the Night Elves found out about it and cut it down but not before Yogg could set up a link to the Emerald Dream, which would eventually start the Emerald Nightmare fiasco. Then, like thousands and thousands of years later, Yogg finally decided to make a push to free himself from his prison. Coincidentally, at the same time that both the full might of the Horde and Alliance were in Northrend to fight the Lich King. Bands of heroes, as player characters are called in lore, managed to kill Loken and free the remaining Watchers who were trapped inside Oldwar. And together, with the help of the Titan Keepers, heroes managed to stop yogg saron from resurfacing and push him back down into his prison. With Loken out of the way, and most of the Titan Keepers back to their jobs of actually watching yogg saron there has been very little involvement with him since.